uncertainty really is approaching those critical levels. The uncertainty is something that is just continues to weigh on markets. The Fed message is clear that they cannot and will not wait for the supply side to move favorably, that they're acting aggressively now. We still expect the Fed to moderate the pace of hikes once it becomes clear that the labor market is beginning to topple over. Stop looking for the Fed to be your friend. Stop looking for Powell to say something conciliatory. He's not. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a messy Monday, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures lower, eight-tenths of one percent on the S&P. TK, it's all about this FX market. It's about the foreign exchange market. We're going to dive into this and take the pro conversation, folks, and try to translate it into English. Here's a tweet just in. Hey, is Farrow paid in sterling? John? Eight in dollars, Tom. Luckily. Good. That's why. That's why he's smiling. <laughs> he's some he's bills he's to smiling pay. this morning. John, I'm old enough to remember this. I never could do the math, but we're going Dickens this morning. John Sterling has elements of the early 1970s back before decimalization. And my math this morning is one pound, not even a shilling, John, two pennies. Three farthings. A different time, Tom. 103.50, the lows of the session. Bramo, what a move. And right now the market is pricing in a 50% chance that you're going to see parity on the pound with the dollar by year end. Talk about just a complete shift in fortunes. But it highlights a problem that is most acute perhaps in the United Kingdom, but that's global. How does the rest of the world deal with king dollar at a time when the economy globally is deteriorating, at a time when energy bills are crimping the potential growth of nations worldwide, and when a Federal Reserve is dead set on raising rates? I refreshed the year-to-date moves on the dollar against G10. Insane. Sterling down 20% against the U.S. dollar this year. The yen down 20% against the U.S. dollar this year. The Swedish currency down almost 20%. <laughs> the Norwegian currency down about 17%. The Swiss franc... It's the uh, relative winner. It's down about 7% against the dollar this year, and likewise the Canadian dollar. These moves are huge, Bramo. They are massive. And they are destabilizing. And we're starting to see the destabilizing aspects of this, which is the yeah. reason why so many people are concerned about some sort of currency crisis. <clears throat> and it's good that you mentioned the yen and the yuan uh, in China and the renminbi, given the fact that there's increasing right. concern they will not be able to control these moves without more drastic action. John, what's important here is they do the cross rates. Let's explain this quickly, because we've got to keep the show moving. You take sterling, the beleaguered, idiosyncratic like Turkish lira, and you run it against something that's equally as beleaguered. So I took sterling against a Korean won. John, it's 3.8, almost four standard deviation strong won. That's a definition of instability. You can throw in euro sterling as well, Tom. Yes. Over the last yes, month. Yes, yes. Not pretty. Europe's in trouble and still sterling, pound sterling is weaker. You got the bow tie sorted. It's I think we saw it out. You look good, TK. I'm not back from London. You're ready to go. Let's go. Futures down, eight tenths of one percent on the SP. I mean, that's that 100. We're down six tenths of one percent. We should do this in a commercial break, Tom. Maybe not live on air. Yields are up nine basis points on a 10 year, 377.68. And it's not just the long end, it's the front end, too. Your two year has been climbing for 13 straight sessions. Yields up another 10 basis points. Lisa, your two year. And just to put this into perspective, last week we saw more than 500 basis points of rate hikes globally from central banks. Just to give you a sense, this is an unprecedented, coordinated global tightening, the likes of which we have never seen before. And this is the reason why people are watching the political moves with that much more attention. What is the response as people start to feel the bite of those higher rates in addition to higher energy prices? And today, French President Emmanuel Macron plans to present his budget to Parliament. And this comes as you have seen energy prices in France come off the recent highs in tandem with the rest of Europe, but still incredibly elevated relative to where they've been historically. And this really raises the issue of the reason why people are watching the UK, people are watching Italy, and seeing what's the political response. How much do some of these governments want to crimp growth in order to save their budgets, in order to save their, uh, their fiscal backdrop and the picture for foreign investors? And this really is highlighting the fraught moment in this regime change when it comes to an economic economic perspective, but also a political one. 9 a.m., ECB's Christine Lagarde is planning to speak before European Parliament in Brussels. I'm watching the Italian 10-year yields, and yes, this is because of the election, but also you talk about closing the spread, 
spreads, right? I mean, John, you were talking about how the ECB said, Christine Lagarde said, it's not our job to close the spread, the gap with Italian yields and German yields. Italian yields blew out, and guess what? It was her job to close the spreads. Well, how much does this become complicated at a time when there's increasing political uh, skepticism and concern about how people are arranging their budgets? And today, who isn't speaking from the Federal Reserve? Well, Jay Powell, but everybody else seems to be. Boston Fed President Susan Collins at 10 a.m., Atlanta Fed President at noon, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan at 12.30 p.m., Cleveland's Loretta Mesta at 4 p.m. This all has to do with the dollar. How many of them start to talk about, John, the concern that a strong dollar is going to torpedo the global economy, that this is going to come back on the U.S.? We heard from Rafael Bosic of the Atlantic Fed over, uh, over the weekend. He said he still sees the possibility for a soft landing. Does that start to become a little bit, I guess, more obsolete in the conversation? Can you imagine just a week, not even a week after Chairman Powell delivered that news conference, they start backtracking because of moves in foreign exchange? I can't imagine that they would, because right oh. now it's not hurting the United States. And if they did that, it would muddy the message and muddy the uh, credibility of this Fed more than it would help the backdrop from a foreign exchange perspective. John, you know, I know we got to get the rust here, but standard deviation analysis is in order, and these are huge, huge moves. And everybody history is they do react to substantial FX instability. Let's get to Russ Kostrick right now, the portfolio manager for the BlackRock Global Allocation Fund. Russ, I'm trying to work out when Rick and Bob get on the phone some Monday morning the call goes around and they say back up the truck let's buy these bonds <laughs> Russ are we close to that moment yet oh good morning Jonathan look I, I think actually you're probably closer to buying bonds than stocks if that's any consolation you know we've had this enormous move and you know one of the things we're talking about nominal yields all the time let's talk about real yields for a moment you look at the 10-year as recently as March the 10-year real yield based on the tips market was negative one percent Check this morning, you're about 130, 140. That's the highest since 2011. Now, granted, we've got a very different inflation environment back then, but what is interesting is that for the first time in years, you can actually build some carry, some yield in the portfolio with bonds, particularly with the short end of the curve. So, look, this is a hard market. Bonds are not acting as a hedge, but you are starting to get to levels where the income is becoming a little bit more interesting. So we're going to hear from a whole host of Fed speakers today, Russ. Do you expect them to push back on some of the hawkish rhetoric and some of the response in markets because of the strong dollar and because of what that does internationally? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, the reality is the Fed was pretty resolute in the last few communications. Uh, I think there was no doubt left in anyone's mind after last week, after Jackson Hole. And again, we know what the Fed is looking at. They're looking at the labor market. They're looking at end user demand. And while we have seen some softening and some deceleration realized inflation, it's just not obvious given, you know, how intense they're being about this, that there are enough signals, <clears throat> enough all clear signals that they're going to give the market a break in the near term. I completely agree. The dollar is a challenge. In addition to this surge in real rates, we're seeing the dollar adding to the tightening financial conditions. And if you want to know while risky assets are down as much as they are, you, know, you don't have to look much further than the Fed in this very rapid shift in financial conditions. Russ, what's the trigger where you go all in? Where you basically said, you said we're close to buying bonds, closer to buying bonds. What's the trigger to let's go? Well, I guess the thing is there never is that trigger. So, I mean, this is about a continuous change rather than a discrete. So we were much more underweight bonds a year ago than we are today. We're still underweight bonds relative to our benchmark, we've closed a lot of that gap. Uh, in terms of, you know, what are some of the milestones? In terms of the short end, I think you're already getting a pretty good yield. If you think about the long end, you know, one thing to consider, typically long end yields have peaked just about where the terminal Fed funds rate is. We know from last week, the terminal Fed funds rate, we're probably not there yet, but certainly as we get to 4% or over that, as we get closer, then maybe think about closing some more of that underweight, closing some more of that gap. A bit of a mere culpa from Chris Harvey and the team over at Wells Fargo, just publishing just moments ago. Here's the quote for our audience. Our belief that we would not retest the 22 low until the first half of 23 was wrong. Despite retesting the lows, we feel the market bottom has not been established and stocks will make newer lows, lower lows, in 2023 as EPS estimates come down and the Fed tightens into recession. Russ, that's the next leg for a lot of people, the next shoe to drop. Do you think we've seen enough of that? Earnings expectations come in? Probably not. Uh, if you look at where earnings estimates are for next year, you're still getting you know, modest growth. Is that consistent with a slowdown in the economy? 
You know, look, I, I have some sympathy for the notion that the next leg for equities is probably more about earnings estimates and about revisions than it's about the multiple. The multiple's already come down a lot. Now, granted, if inflation stays sticky, there's room for more multiple compression, but I would be more worried about the earnings side. One of the things we are doing in the portfolio, we're very underweight equities, but in the equities we do have, we're emphasizing earnings consistency, margin consistency, cons uh, profitability, because these are the characteristics they think are going to be challenged in 23 with the economy slowing. Hey, Russ, thank you, sir. <clears throat> Got to kick off the week with you. Russ Kostrick yes. there of BlackRock with equities down, Tom, and yields my child. Yeah, I, I haven't got time to get to it yet. There's so much to look at. The, the, it's such a rich moment, folks, in truly currency history being made. George Cervello's publishing moments ago. We'll get to that. John, the VIX, 32.56. We've come out over 30. I'm doing some studies on it and that. But the question, John, is there catharsis out there? And to the Harvey note, I don't sense the catharsis from, say, Thursday through to where we are now. What's the Chris phrase, Tom? The cathartic puke that Chris Harvey would look for over at Wells Fargo. Oh, that so may be, I, that's not that. CFA talk, but, you know. That's his phrase, not mine. I know, so. no, I know. Yeah. But they don't use when, catharsis with a CFA. When I say that phrase, people are like, that's so unladylike. What's, what's wrong? Are you serious? Is that what people say to you? Oh, yeah. That is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> How could you? It's completely uh, crass in the morning. Boundaries. But I agree. It's a cathartic puke that we're that. looking for. No, I agree. It's a gender neutral term. <laughs> Futures down nine tenths <laughs> on the SP. On the NASDAQ, exactly. <laughs> down six tenths of 1% oh, on the, the NASDAQ. On the SP. We're down eight happen. or nine tenths of 1% on the SP. Yields are up eight basis points on a 10 year. The two year climbing for a 13th straight session. The last time the two year yield had a down day was September 7th, and the yield was 343. Right now, wow. it's 428. Live from New York, looking forward to covering these markets with you on TV and radio. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, concern about Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng's fiscal policies has sent the pound plunging to an all-time low. Sterling fell below $1.04 at one point after Kwarteng said there are, is more to come on tax cuts. But there are fears that cutting taxes even more will send inflation and government debt soaring. The OECD has slashed its global growth forecast for next year, saying the world has been jolted by the war in Ukraine. The Paris-based organization says the global economy will expand just 2.2% in 2023. That's down from its previous forecast of 2.8%. The OECD also expects further interest rate hikes. Italy is on track to have its first female prime minister. Georgia Maloney won a clear majority in Sunday's election. That sets her up to head the most right-wing government since World War II. Maloney emerged from the political fringes after leading the opposition to Mario Draghi's technocratic administration. There's growing speculation that Russia may restrict its borders to keep men eligible for the mobilization from leaving the country. Russian men and their families flocked to borders over the weekend. Witnesses reported hours-long lines at Moscow's main airport and at land crossings. A new poll says most Democrats want the party to replace President Biden as its 2024 nominee. According to the Washington Post ABC News poll, just 35 percent of Democrats and Democrat-leaning independents support the president for nomination. Meanwhile, 47 percent of Republicans and Republican-leading in independents want former President Trump to be GOP's nominee. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. What I'm determined to do as Prime Minister and what the Chancellor is determined to do is make sure we are incentivising businesses to invest and we're also helping ordinary people with their <coughs> taxes. And that's why I don't feel it's right uh, to have higher national insurance and higher corporation tax because that will make it harder for us to attract the investment we need in the UK. It will be harder 
uh, to generate those new jobs. Let's try the UK Prime Minister on CNN over the weekend. Live from New York City, good morning. Just some monster moves in this market. Let's start with equities. We're down eight tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down a half of 1%. Yields are higher on a 10-year Treasury by seven basis points, 375.87. <laughs> Euro dollar, still not used to this. 96.48, yeah. negative four tenths of 1%. <clears throat> this, though, nothing like the moves we're seeing in sterling and in gilts. Tom Pound sterling, a little bit earlier this right. morning, trading right now with a 107 handle this morning at 103. And still, 107 is a shock, and 103 takes us back to the early 70s. John, we aim to please off the terminal. You mentioned euro sterling, of course, incredibly important for both Europe and the United Kingdom. I was stunned. You nailed it, John, and I didn't realize uh, the move. This is the kind of thing that gets the IMF going. This is the kind of thing that gets the New York Fed desk in New York at going five standard deviations out on euro sterling, strong euro. That is extraordinary. I've never seen that, John. Unreal, Tom. Just unreal. Yeah. Joining us now is Lizzie Burden over in Liverpool. Lizzie, you're at the Labour Party conference, I'm told. Can you tell me whether every MP there has now got the Bloomberg app and a live feed of, of where Sterling is trading? Everyone that comes past and chats to me is asking me where the pound is at. So they certainly are not ignoring the markets, despite Kwasi Kwarteng, the Chancellor, saying that the markets will do what they will. I was speaking to the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, earlier, and she was making a clear plea to the financial markets that the Labour uh, Party can be trusted if they are the next government. Uh, and it's the same message from Pat McFadden, the Chief Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, uh, that they would be more credible. They're trying to set out their vision if they were the government, but we really need to be convinced uh, that they can afford all the plans that they're setting out, as well as all the public spending, because, of course, over the weekend, uh, the Labour Party said that they would... Uh, carry on with the proposals from the Tory government, uh, including uh, specifically the cut to basic income tax and the reversal of the rise in the payroll tax. They'd scrap the top rate uh, cut, but they're very expensive pledges that they're making. And Lizzie, given we've also got the Conservative Party conference later on as well this week, can you tell me how united that party is behind some of these moves by their government? You're stirring mischief here, John. Uh, this is what we're waiting to see. Will more of the Rishi Sunak faction, who, of course, ran against Liz Truss to be the leader, pipe up? We've already heard from John Glenn, a Sunak ally, from uh, their time together at the Treasury, uh, saying uh, that he disagreed with these plans. You also had... Uh, I spoke to Mel Stride, the chairman of the Treasury Select Committee. He was Rishi Sunak's campaign chief. On the morning of the <coughs> fiscal package on Friday, he was saying uh, that the Office for Budget Responsibility, the official fiscal watchdog, should have been given the chance to right. assess the economic impact of these plans. You have to ask whether part of these market moves are because this, uh, these plans didn't have the credibility of an official forecast. Lizzie, most of us in America get our Labour and Tory politics off movies like The Queen or The Crown, the Netflix series, in that how close is this Labour Party to Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, or is there something new about it beyond two decades? Well, I think the big difference is the handling of the unions, which are, of course, a hot topic right now, given we've got double-digit well, around double-digit inflation, uh, and you've got strike action, including here in Liverpool at the port. The dockers saying that they want to be paid in line with inflation. Uh, and at the top of the Labour Party, you've got Angela Rayner, the deputy leader, uh, saying that she would repeal all the government's legislation that's stopping the strikers. Uh, and yet you've got Keir Starmer, the opposition party leader, saying that his front bench can't be on the picket line backing uh, the strikers. So there seems to be uh, a bit of disunity there, whereas Tony Blair, of course, managed to uh, do a very different job when it came to the unions. There's also a bit of disunity when it comes to the Bank of England versus the government. There is some discussion and some pricing in the market right now of the Bank of England meeting in between meetings and raising rates in order to stave off some of the declines that we've seen in sterling. What's your view of how the government would respond to that? 
Well, definitely all eyes on the Bank of England now. The, the government could only welcome it if the Bank of England stepped in to save the currency at this point. You've talked about how much the pound has tanked as a result of Kwasi Kwarteng announcing that more tax cuts are going to be in the pipeline. Even before all those pound moves, Deutsche, an analyst at Deutsche Bank on Friday was saying that uh, the Bank of England needs to step in to uh, uh, regain credibility in this situation. I think it's 165 basis points of hikes in November now price, which implies we're going to get an intra-meeting hike. Uh, but of course it's difficult for Andrew Bailey uh, because he doesn't want to be seen to be responding to fiscal policy more than to inflation. The other question is, are they going to put the brakes <coughs> on active guilt sales? Because it raises exactly the same dilemma. Lucy Burden, thank you. Live from the Labour Party conference, the opposition party in the United Kingdom. We'll have the Conservative Party conference later on in the next week or so. UK policy is in conflict. We've talked about that a lot over the last couple of months. The prospect that this would happen, that's the reality now. So we've got looser fiscal policy, fueling expectations of tighter monetary policy. And Tom, I think the greatest unknown at the moment is it's still unclear whether the BOE will step up and validate market pricing and totally unclear to me on how the government would respond yeah. to that if they did. A lot of good reading over the weekend on this. I thought The Economist did a great job, John, going back to Reagan 1. There were two parts of the Reagan supply side experiment. Number one was a lot like what we're seeing right now, lots of optimism, this is going to work, this is going to work, we're all going to get growthy. And uh, the second part of Reaganomics was really, really sport. I wonder in the modern age, John, the open economy, how quickly that occurs. We'll see how quickly that kicks in. Yeah. Lisa, can growth bail out this story? And how quickly do they need to get that? But you were raising this point about what is the interaction between central banks and governments, especially if they're at odds with each other. And you've been talking about this extensively, John, and you are correct to do so because we have not seen anything like this in history. Mohamed El Arian wrote in The Guardian in the last 24 hours, and he's got this beautiful, beautiful concept, this idea that you're pressing the accelerator and the brake at the same time. What happens? Yeah. The smoke is coming out of Sterling's ears. Yeah. That's what's happening right now. You burn out the car. John, Big time. Arsenal Tottenham. Uh, I'm pleased you're so focused on me. <laughs> it's cheaper now. That's not it, how you spell it. It's more affordable. Live from New York City, good morning. Kicking off a trading week in a big way. Futures down six tenths of one percent on the S and P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a third of one percent. Equities off the lows. The action elsewhere in the bond market and in foreign exchange. Treasuries two tens and thirty shaping up as follows for a thirteenth consecutive session. Yields higher at the front end this morning Stunning. by seven or eight basis points. They're just short of four thirty. Four point two seven. Seven nine, call it 428 on a US two year. If you get to what's happening in the UK, I want to frame the UK over the last month and have a look at where the two year yield is of the Treasury market and the two year in the gilt market. So we're up 88 basis points over the last month on a US two year, up 169 basis points so double. on a UK two year. Double it's been a monster move worldwide, Tom. It's just been more acute yeah. more recently in UK markets. And that's why you're seeing this bigger move in sterling too. Or 107.37. Yeah. We're going to devote ourselves to this this week. And what it comes down to, John, is the heart of the matter is flows. And I love what George Cervellos published moments ago with Deutsche Bank. He goes through the usual litany that everybody has, but he really talks about the nation's that are going to have to rely on the kindness of strangers, not sterling, where it's a real economy with real employment, but other EM-type economies that are going to fall flat on their back and they're going to cry for help. Tom, you're raising a really important point here, and I think it's worth sitting on. If you take a look at the makeup of the gilt market and who holds it, yeah. about 30 percent of the gilt market, UK debt, is held by foreigners. The important component, I think, of the UK debt market that separates it from in EM, which people have been throwing at the UK over the last month or so, mm -hmm. particularly, is that the UK doesn't have this huge outstanding debt pile of foreign denominated debt, Tom. That's a key feature yeah. that I think differentiates <laughs> themselves from having this kind of negative downward self-fulfilling spiral that an emerging market might have. Let's get to it right now. We're going to continue to monitor foreign exchange as best we can. The DXY out near a 114 roundup is just extraordinary. John had to go out and find somebody on the streets of New York who's British and poor. Joining us, Caelan Pickering, senior economist <laughs> at Berenberg Bank. What is it like to be paid in sterling and to enjoy a cup of coffee in Manhattan That's this I'm, morning? I'm paying even more for bad coffee. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> 
Let's get to it. Your insight here on trustonomics. I saw Martin Wolf. I saw The Economist, the great work at Bloomberg. Your immediate insight on this experiment of the prime minister. I think if the government had more credibility, markets would be more sanguine about it. We have a government here that lacks economic policy credibility since the Brexit vote. Markets don't like Brexit. They've been very nervous over the last few years about what's going on on the Northern Irish border. And it means actually the detail at the moment isn't what is driving these markets. It's just the view that the UK is going to borrow more. If I really lean back, though, I find it hard to label this a panic. If I look at the moves in interest rate expectations, if I look at the moves in inflation expectations, what I see is that captures all of the move in gilts. So we don't have an outsized move here, which means me, you know, does the Bank of England intervene? If you can't see this as a genuine panic, I don't think they do. I think they stand by and see how markets play out. They stand by and see how the politics plays out as well. Do they risk their, and let's remember, this is a young experiment. That's right. Do they risk their independence? No, I think the Bank of England doesn't risk its independence. It reacts just to the inflation risks. The problem with trustonomics is we only have, let's say, one two parts of three parts so far. We have the tax cuts. They're substantial, but if you look at the detail, actually they don't go as far as the headlines might suggest. Not hiking corporation taxes is not going to be stimulating demand much. The regulatory stuff looks good, but markets just prefer good old-fashioned Keynesian demand-side shifts in economic policy. Supply-side policy is complicated. It will take time. The third element is what happens with government spending. I would not be surprised if the government actually sees this <coughs> reaction and says, we need to come out with something soon to shore up confidence that we're not going to be borrowing excessively. So expect, I think, some policies to cut government spending, to downsize both sides of the state, the tax side and the spending side. Oh, Callum, from what you're saying, then, do you think the government blinks before this Bank of England does? Um, I think that would make much more sense. I think if the Bank of England steps, here, steps in here aggressively and hikes rates against this huge supply side shock. Remember, the context of all of this is that markets are incredibly worried that the West is basically heading into a recession. I think we're already in a recession in the UK and Europe. US is probably going to trail a little. And then the Bank of England and the uh, UK Treasury are, well, A, the Bank of England is behind the curve. B, the Treasury is about to borrow all this cash to cut taxes. This is an experiment. The UK is now sticking its neck out. The Bank of England doesn't want to double down on the recession pressure by hiking interest rates in order to get these inflation expectations down. It would be better, actually, if the government came out and said, well, actually, if you look at our tax cuts, they're spread over the next few months, and we're going to cut government spending too. So I think it's the borrowing side that markets are afraid of. Um, It's not necessarily the fact that the Bank of England is going to have to help the government bring down inflation. It's a complicated issue. Unpicking this is not easy. Callum, with a lot of people, I think they're uncomfortable with consensus, particularly over the last couple of years. And overwhelmingly, the consensus is this is the wrong thing to do. Is there a small part of you that thinks that perhaps this risk might be a risk worth taking? Well, I'm actually as it goes, a bit more sanguine about all of this. I think the tax cuts, by and large, make sense. I think the regulatory policy, by and large, makes sense. There's some weird stuff in there. I don't think we should have a growth target in the UK. 2.5% is just going to be virtually impossible to hit while you've got Brexit uncertainty hanging over the economy. Um, But again, I think it just comes down to a view that the UK lacks credibility in markets now since the Brexit vote, since the Bank of England let inflation get so high. And so to be non-consensus in your economic policy is just asking for a negative reaction. I think, again, if we had a more credible government, markets would look more carefully at this and see actually cutting taxes into a recession for an economy that can largely follow the uh, take the additional borrowing with some decent deregulation policy may actually lift trend growth over the next few years. That should be taken positively. It's just markets aren't thinking clearly at the moment. They're not pricing on fundamentals. And the UK has basically asked for a negative reaction with this policy, and it's got it. Callum, John recently requested that we have a meteorologist on on a regular basis to give us a sense of what this winter looks like, and perhaps that would be more accurate than a lot of prognostications. How much does the UK budget make sense with a warm winter? Ah, good, good question. Um, the, big, the real policy to focus on is the energy price cap. Um, if that was the only thing that the UK had announced, I think the markets would be fairly happy with the fiscal move. Um, essentially, what the government has said is your energy prices aren't going to go up for the next two years further than they already have. That's probably a sensible policy. We could be looking at eye-watering energy bills if you didn't cap energy prices somehow. I think it's probably a bit too broad-based. You could have just focused on the households that really needed it. But that policy will basically cut at least three percentage points off peak inflation. We'll probably get to about 10.5 and top out. And it will probably mean that inflation rolls over 
with confidence next year once these energy price base effects. We're not going to be worried about a renewed spike this time next year. That's a fairly good policy. And essentially, it would be an act of God where energy prices would be if you didn't introduce that policy. And so it makes sense, warm winter or cold winter, this is probably the right thing to do. Okay, but on the flip side, there's a concern that if you don't dampen demand, you're just going to have the same problem all over again. You're going to create a spiral of spending, just basically that's fueling uh, the pickup in demand that <coughs> offsets the whole point of the program. What would you like to see from that demand-driven type of policy that could potentially bring this more into balance? Demand is certainly a part of it in the UK, no doubt. This is not continental Europe where virtually all of the inflation can be explained by supply. But what you don't have is a US style situation where demand is racing well ahead of its pre-COVID um, trend. What you have is a supply problem and robust demand in the UK. So the question is, what would inflation be if you didn't have this supply problem? Inflation expectations before this recent fiscal intervention might provide a good guide. You'd be looking at about two and a half, two point six percent on a five year break even. That's high inflation, uh, but it's not incredible inflation. It probably justifies the bank raising interest rates a little north of three percent. So that's the thing to focus on here. My study is that current account balances matter in yep. this and it's something the media doesn't talk about a lot we love to talk about sterling to four decimal points mm -hmm. in that i've got up the united kingdom current account balance folks as a percent of gdp crisis 1974 yep. 1989 2016 and they're all pointy stochastic it gets fixed are we close to where it gets fixed no, I don't think so. Um, the UK is not borrowing in a foreign currency. It's mainly borrowing in sterling. John made a great point earlier. If you actually look at structural demand for um, UK gilts, most of it's domestic. About 30% is international. Um, and most of that is covered by a decent investment position in the UK. What you have here is the UK importing much more energy with a weaker currency. Um, if you look through this, if you look through this recession, sterling is likely to be stronger, energy prices will be lower. So I don't see a structural current account problem that would normally drive a currency Interesting. crisis. Interesting. Interesting. Callum, thank you. As always, enjoy the bad coffee. Just brilliant. You're in thank New you. York. That's what the Brits are good at, Tom Banter. You see that comeback from Callum there? It's yeah, fantastic. It's it's kind great. of pickering. You know. Tom, I think it's really important like at this Eddie moment. I mean, really, it reminds oh, me of Eddie Izzard. Really important at this moment, Tom, to get a better understanding of the gilt market. Thank you. There's a reason that the Bank of England yep. is actually going to be actively selling gilts. The reason is, is because the average maturity of the gilt market, Tom, is 15 years, compared to, say, five years in a Treasury right. market. So if you're a central bank with a balance sheet, and if you were just going to allow roll-off, obviously, if your average maturity is 15 years, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. So the situation in the UK is very, very different yep. to the Treasury market. And when we start to frame the comparisons, it's important to include some of that detail. Well, this is really important, folks. We're going to do this all through the week of this, what is clearly a crisis. There's no other way to put it. And, John, one of them is the way mortgages are done. Here, there's a whole fixed mortgage rate culture. And am I correct that most, you know, the thing you're looking at in Knightsbridge and the others, that they're mostly floating rate? Well, not just that, Tom. The priced off bank rate. <clears throat> That's the important difference between the UK and the US. So when you get a central bank hike from the Bank of England, that is what you're pricing your mortgage off, if it's variable rate. Right there. That's yeah. the bigger difference, yeah. Yeah. OK, well, I'm learning every day. I mean, I, I'm I think sorry. if you buy in Knightsbridge, you probably bought it cash too, Tom. So. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, if you can afford Knightsbridge. You know, well, we've got to go back October 1 leverage. to close the real estate, and Arsenal happens to be playing the tops. You're having a little look, Tom. You yeah, second look at the house. You think we should go back and have a look around the UK I bring again? Lisa, you yeah. know. I'm not sure Lisa wants to come again. I think that was her one visit for the year. I think Bramo's done. It's like Lisa's done. <laughs> Lisa's going to stay here. We're down seven tenths on the S and P. On the Nasdaq, we're down a half of one percent. Yields are higher by seven basis points on a ten-year three seventy-five sixty-seven. Because Lisa's kids are going to get in touch now. That's it. The trouble. Yeah. Had to leave again. <laughs> yeah, they're going to basically say Bramo's we're going boys. Bramo's boys want to come to the UK with us if we go to the UK Very next cool. time. <laughs> They'll be sitting that's, on set with that's, us. That's the change. Well behaved lads. He did once sit on set with me. I no, he did. He, he told us about Apple. Live on Bloomberg Radio and talked about Apple, and he was fantastic. <laughs> Rivaling Dan Ives <laughs> from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The sell off in the UK assets has gone into overdrive. The pound plunged to an all time low before rebounding, and government bonds were slammed. Now there are calls for aggressive rate hikes by the Bank of England. The latest tumble was fueled by Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng's comment on Sunday that there's more to come on tax cuts. 
In China, the Communist Party has reaffirmed President Xi Jinping as its core. The party published its list of almost 2,300 delegates to attend next month's leadership summit. The announcement brings Xi to a step closer to clinching an unprecedented third term in power at the event. The Philippines is talking to Russia about buying fuel and other key commodities. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. told Bloomberg TV that national interest overrides concerns about the war in Ukraine. Now maybe we need to approach Russia uh, that maybe they can do so now uh, and uh, provide us with uh, uh, some fuel. Marcos says the Philippines is close to reaching deals with Russia and other countries. And the CEO of Unilever plans to retire at the end of 2023 after only five years on the job. Alan Jope presided over a tumultuous period where the consumer goods company botched a potential $53 billion deal and irked investors with lackluster growth. Unilever's board says it's starting a search for Jope's successor. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think the UK is behaving a bit like an emerging market turning itself into uh, a submerging uh, market. It would not surprise me if the pound eventually gets below a dollar if the current policy path uh, is maintained. I'm sure that sounded like a big call at one point on Friday. Then this morning, 103.50, we came pretty close. That was Larry Summers, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, live from New York. Good morning. Equities <clears throat> down six tenths on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a half of 1%. Not really the drama-filled morning on the equity side you might expect, given what's happening in the bond market. Of seven or eight basis points on a 10-year, 376. Dollar strength, the dominant story in foreign exchange through the year so far. Euro dollar, 96.51. And pound sterling, five straight sessions of weakness over those five days. Cable is negative six percentage points. Tom, a weak, weak pound over the last week. What we're trying to do and our team worked all through the weekend, given the turmoil, to give you the voices that matter. And of course, a cross-section here of strategists, economists, and even with a political band, of course, Lizzie, uh, up with the Labor Party at their effort in Liverpool. Right now from Goldman Sachs, their co-head of global foreign exchange, interest rates, and EM strategy, Kamchacha Trivedi, joins us uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Trivedi, wonderful to speak to you this morning. And I think I want to go to what the politicians need to do to avert the tumult in your world. How do we get from Trussonomics 1, a la Reaganomics 1, out to Trussonomics 2, or Reaganomics 2, which was tax increases and a pullback? How do we get there? Yeah, good morning. Uh, that parallel is interesting. I mean, I think you mentioned Reaganomics, you know, at that time as well, you had, you know, in massive tax uh, cuts, which encouraged already high inflation. But there were two important differences. The dollar, you know, is a reserve currency. It has that exorbitant privilege. Uh, but you also had the Fed under Chairman Walker, who, uh, you know, clearly moved interest rates very high to bring down inflation. And even with those benefits, as you mentioned, you know, Reagan Mark II was you had some of those uh, tax cuts partially, partially reversed. And so I think you're going to need to see uh, some combination of this to, to stabilize what is going on in currency markets, what is going on in, 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 pound, in, the, in the pound specifically, uh, some communication that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that you know, emphasizes the fact that fiscal credibility is, is not at risk and monetary policy will be firmly targeted at uh, bringing inflation down uh, uh, over, over the, the medium to short horizons. Okay, Mick, I want to pick up on that in the UK specifically. Do we have a recipe for a self-fulfilling downward spiral if we don't have the foreign currency debt ingredient present in the UK gilt market? I think you're right. I mean, I think I, I, I heard some of the, you know, I hear some of these comparisons of with emerging markets. I think they're very unhelpful comparisons, uh, not least because most EM currencies have not fallen as much as the pound this year, but also because, you know, the UK does not have, as you mentioned, foreign currency denominated debt. It has a very long maturity 
uh, of its uh, of its debt in in terms of the overall uh, public debt burden. Um, and so, you know, the concern here is not so much that the UK cannot service its debt. That's not really the issue. I think the concern is more whether the the, the package announced, uh, you know, broad fiscal spending, unfunded, not particularly targeted, will you know add to the inflation. Uh, you lead to sort of more guilds that need to be uh, issued, and that requires a cheapening of uh, of guilds. That is partly what is going on in the market, both through you know guilds actually selling off, but also through the currency depreciating. So the moves are extreme, but they are explainable. Kamakshi, a lot of people are talking about a currency crisis brewing, unlike what we have seen in decades. And people point to what's happening in the United Kingdom. But even more around the corners, they're pointing to what's happening over in Asia with respect to the yen, with respect to the Chinese renminbi. How concerned are you about that area and the willingness to really stage some sort of intervention at a time when the U.K. doesn't really have the foreign currency reserves to even stage an intervention if they wanted to? I think there are some different issues. I mean, you're right, you know, the, the broad North Asia complex is also moving, but I'd say there's two or three differences. First, you know, yes, we are in the midst of a broad dollar move. We expect the dollar to continue to weaken, and that's taking a lot of currencies, you know, with it. Uh, you know, yen and yuan are part of that. But, you know, look, in the case of yen, uh, the Bank of Japan has an explicit policy to keep yields uh, fixed even as they go up in the rest of the world, in particular the US. In the case of China, the, the economic struggles that the economy is facing means that they're actually lowering or easing interest rates as part of their uh, uh, easing financial conditions mix. And again, you compare that to a Fed that is relatively unconstrained uh, in terms of moving rates higher and has a steady growth backdrop. When you put those two things together, it shouldn't be a huge surprise to see these currencies weaken. Of course, the policymakers typically don't like the speed at which these things happen. Uh, and so you've seen the intervention in the yen, you've seen you know, measures to slow the pace of the yuan depreciation. But ultimately, I think you know, for a kind of meaningful or sustained uh, shift in these, in these trends, you actually need a shift in the policy framework. And that's not something that we expect. But Kabakshi, I guess the, the bigger way to ask this is, at what point do some of the moves, whether it's in the United Kingdom or whether it's in Asia, become a trigger point for something larger that the Fed has to respond to? Look, I think that, you know, one of the one of the issues right now is that the stronger dollar is actually you know helping the fed with what is its uh, you know its its high inflation problem to the extent that they are very focused on the inflation remit and bringing inflation down uh, you know the higher the stronger dollar is on the margin helping uh, from that standpoint so i think that you know at least for, whereas as far as that is concerned, I don't think the strong dollar will be will be bothering them. I think at some point, if you really see the strong dollar, but alongside that, you know, significant weakening in the domestic economy, or you know, what would be a better outcome if inflation starts to peak and come down? I think that is the point at which the Fed starts to uh, to to care about this. For now, I suspect they are still very focused on their their inflation mandate. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the combination of steady growth and, and large Fed hikes is going to be hard for a lot of people across the world to match. It's difficult right now. Kamak Shia, as always, sir, great to catch up. Kamak Shia Trivedi there of Goldman Sachs. This from Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley this go. morning. Here's the quote on the U.S. dollar. The recent moves in the U.S. dollar creates an untenable situation for risk assets that historically has ended in a financial or economic crisis or both. And some they put on a rolling year-over-year -year chart of the U.S. dollar, up something like 20 percent or so over the last year. Yeah, well, and all the different crises over the last, I don't know, few decades off the back of it. Well, Carl Weinberg was mesmerizing on us. He lived this, John, with Ecuador and a bunch of South American economies here in the 90s and the, the 80s. And all I can say, John, is we're becoming overcome by events. We don't need to get mathy on it. We don't need to turn it into a chart-a-thon other than to say we're committed, folks, and not just showing you pound sterling against a dollar against a euro. This is much more, and John, this is much, much richer, starting, for example, with Korean won. Futures, Tom, we're down six tenths of one percent on the S&P <coughs> on the Nasdaq. We're down four tenths of one percent. Yields are higher by eight basis points on a 10 year, 3.76 percent on a U.S. 10 year. Live from New York City with Tom Keane, Lisa Brabitz and Jonathan Ferro, Phil Camparelli of J.P. Morgan joining us very shortly. Heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg.
uncertainty really is approaching those critical levels. The uncertainty is something that is just continues to weigh on markets. The Fed message is clear that they cannot and will not wait for the supply side to move favorably, that they're acting aggressively now. We still expect the Fed to moderate the pace of hikes once it becomes clear that the labor market is beginning to topple over. Stop looking for the Fed to be your friend. Stop looking for Powell to say something conciliatory. He's not. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Yields up, stocks down, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down seven tenths on the S&P. TK, this dollar still climbing. The dollar is still climbing. And to be, sure, to be sure here, folks, this is not just about John's United Kingdom. It's about a disunited emerging markets all reacting to this. It's in every pair globally. We'll commit to that today, John. And what it means is you've got to look for the shocks there along this path. Global bond yields, TK, oh, what a shocker. <clears throat> 13 consecutive yeah. days of two-year yields climbing, eight consecutive weeks of 10-year Treasury yields climbing into this one. Could it become nine? Tom, the last time we had a down week on a 10-year yield was back in late July, and the yield was 265. Right now, 377. So how do you distill this? And the answer, folks, is you watch the real yield Friday afternoons on Bloomberg and through the weekend with Jonathan uh, Farrell. What the pros are doing, John, is they're distilling the bond FX correlation down to a real yield analysis. And in the United States, the real yield, the inflation-adjusted yield, is a moonshot. Bloomberg real yield is no longer with me because because I keep failing to turn up for work. <laughs> it's now with Lisa Brown. It's weekdays, Fridays, it's not. She's, she really doesn't want it to be. Although she could be. It could be with you, Lisa, okay. if you want it to be. You never ask me. If you look change your mind, you know, let look, us know. Look at those markets. Look at those Let's markets. I mean, what right a move now. in a global bond market. We've just blown up a decade worth of zero interest rates, negative rates worldwide. And this is having real consequences on the real yield uh, equation. And we heard this from Russ Kostrich of BlackRock earlier, that suddenly you're actually getting income. And we keep talking about this. But when we take a look at the 10-year inflation-adjusted yield at nearly 1.4%, John, uh, based on the decade or so of zero or negative uh, real rates, this all of a sudden is offering an attractive uh, opposition to potentially risk, like stocks. Are you waiting to see if anyone comes out and downgrades their forecasts on the S&P? as I am. We've already seen it. And how much further does it have to go? And what's the rationale going to be? And this is going to be a really interesting aspect of it. Oh. Is, is it because of shrinking margins? Is it because of global growth deteriorating? Or is it because there just isn't the same kind of consumer demand at a time of uh, hiking rates? This will be the most interesting part to me. John, the VIX 32.41 and none of that without catharsis. We're just sort of there from a 28 out to 31, 32. 2.53 points this morning. That doesn't show me the sweat, the emotion you need. JP Morgan's still at 4,800. Just pencil that one in. We should hear from them a little bit later on this afternoon. Uh, and we'll see if we finally get that kind of capitulation because, Lisa, there are still some holdouts right now. There are still some holdouts. Do you think that if they have some capitulation, you're talking about Marco Kalanovic, maybe? I'm suggesting perhaps? maybe he might be publishing at lunchtime today. So we'll see. If he does, and if he says, you know what, I've been wrong. I've been really wrong. I'm now bearish. How many people say, all right, back up the truck? There'll be a line full of people <laughs> saying yes. that. Yes, 100%. Just the debate at the moment. Futures down eight tenths on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about six tenths of 1%. Yields higher on a 10-year by nine basis points, 377.88. It's not just about sterling weakness. Dollar strength is so, so powerful this year. Euro dollar 96.38. Lisa, that currency pair negative a half of 1%. This very much is the energy story. This very much is the inflation story. This very much is the strength of the U.S. and the Fed versus the ECB. But it's also a political story, and increasingly so. Today, French President Emmanuel Macron plans to present a budget to Parliament. How much does he try to offset some of the higher energy prices of consumers in France. This really goes to the political question of the moment, which is what is the response and how does that really rebound into growth? Do you prioritize bringing inflation down? Do you prioritize supporting households or do you prioritize growth? Can you have your cake and eat it too? The market is saying no. Right now, also at 9 a.m., ECB's Christine Lagarde will be speaking before European Parliament in Brussels. How much is she committed to trying to narrow the gap in yields from the peripheral regions and uh, the core. How much do you get this sense that they are committed to offsetting
upsetting the potentially outsized rate hikes that they are all but committing to. And today, there will be a host of Fed speak. It is back. Boston Fed President Susan Collins at 10 a.m., Atlanta Fed uh, President Raphael Bostic at uh, around noon, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan at 1230 p.m., Cleveland Loretta Mester at 4 p.m. Do they talk about the dollar, John? How concerned are they about weakness in the rest of the world as a ramification of very hawkish Fed policy? Do you remember when we all turned to Vice Chair, former Vice Chair Richard Clowder, and said, do you want the bad news? The, the quiet period is over for the Federal Reserve, and he just laughed and couldn't <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> it was an uncontrolled laughter. It really raises this issue of the tension between uh, the real leadership of the Federal Reserve and then all of the noise around the message. Did that you just call all those that. Fed speakers noise? I think you did. No, I, but here's the this issue. Close. As a market participant, it is noise that you have to pay attention to, but when you get non-voting members that try to influence the conversation that don't necessarily pay attention to the main uh, conversation of, of the leadership, what does that do to credibility of the Fed? And it really raises some questions for longer term. I totally agree. Joining us now here in New York, I'm pleased to say Phil Camperoni, Portfolio Manager at JP Morgan Asset Management. Staying awake all weekend, waiting for Aaron Judge to do something he never did. <laughs> Phil, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's start with this market. One good reason to be bullish right now, Phil. What is it? Well, one good reason to be bullish is that uh, we have rates that are getting to a point, John, uh, where we think at a minimum should provide some ballast. And if we're <clears> really transitioning, John, from an environment where folks are really worried about inflation to a point where growth and earnings and margin compression start to take hold, uh, the bond market should 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 play a good role in a portfolio. But here's the here's the real problem with risk mar risk assets, and this is why we're positioned so defensively. Policymakers wish they can use a scalpula. Instead, they're using a sledgehammer. And when you use a sledgehammer, you're going to break things. And I think that's what's happening right, right now in, in, in markets. And this is why we have in portfolios about an 8% underweight to stocks in a 60-40 type portfolio. And we have no, no real reason to adjust that uh, at this point. Mostly away from stocks, mm -hmm. they are stochastic adjustments. It's pointy. You go down, something changes, you go back up. And to your point, mm -hmm. Greg Vallier was scathing about the Fed in the middle of last week and reaffirms that uh, this morning. Morning. He just says they flat out blew it a year ago and they're blowing it right now. Mm -hmm. well, how does your world change if Chairman Powell blinks? Um, he goes to 75 to 50 or even more. Yeah, so so in a way they're getting there, Tom, because most of their tightening is already done. So I don't think they're going to blink anytime soon. There is no Fed put with an inflation rate with a, with an aid handle, but they are getting there. They they have completely bought into the fact that they're going to move by another 125 this year, maybe another 50 next year. But Tom, at that point, they're at a point where they can pause and assess what they're doing. I think they're really afraid of going by 75 base points. They don't know what the ramifications of that are, but they have no other. Well, we're choice seeing to do the that. ramifications right now, Lisa. Help Help me here. Do we get to a point on West Texas Intermediate where it gets so low that it's too low? I mean, do, you know, it's $69 a barrel. What do we do? Well, it'll be too low with respect to the message that it's sending about global growth. And Phil, this goes to the question of your 8% underweight of stocks in your yep. portfolio. What are you holding? What are you buying? Yeah. When do you start to change? Yeah. So here, here's one thing that caught our eye on Friday. Lisa, the American Association of Individual Investors, their bull bear sentiment hasn't been this bearish since March of 2009. And we all remember what March of 2000, March 9th of 2009 was the bottom of the market and it got very and it got very bearish. But again, we are not at the point where we're adjusting just yet. We are very, very interested, though, in the front end of the U.S. curve. So things like cash, which I used to call trash in the world of negative interest rates, zero interest rate policy, right? Those sort of things for us make some sense as we sit and wait. We also like investment grade corporate bonds. I think the, the positive real rate story that you were referring to a couple of minutes ago, that really hurt mega cap stock. That really hurt some of the portions of the market that did so well in the last cycle. Investment grade corporate bonds, in the front end of the U.S. curve makes some, makes some sense for us. Now, this isn't the most glamorous trade ever. I wish I can come here and say we believe that, you know, you should be buying stocks here, but not just yet. So overweight the front end of the curve. Cash makes some sense in the portfolio as we, as we sit and wait, but not yet on the stock market. Phil, we've just left behind a market regime dominated by zero interest rates, mm -hmm. negative rates in various central banks, including Europe, the ECB, the S&B, and elsewhere, yeah. and QE. Mm -hmm. We've blown that up in the last 12 months. Yep. Phil, any reason to believe we ever go back to it anytime soon? 
Um, so the, you never sign a zero probability to any event. I was taught that a long, a long time ago. Also, John, the Bloomberg Aggregate Index is having its worst year ever. I'm just typing okay? it up. It's just like we're channeling here, John. It's too much. Yeah. Camparelli and I are channeling it. It's like this is a night for a judge if he's playing. John, the index that Phil's talking about, negative 18% from the top. Carry yeah. on, Phil. Yep. So I, I, I think at, at this point, it's hard to imagine going back anytime soon. However, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, they're almost at the end of their tightening cycle. What happens, John, when we do get to the point where inflation is not an eight handle anymore, starts to move lower, and then you have an environment where growth is scarce again, which, which brings to the forefront all of those mega cap growth stocks. However, that's not right now. Right now is be defensive and look for the opportunity to add back to risk if and when the Fed pauses because of a, a deliberate and explicit move lower inflation. John, that's not any time over the next couple of months. A final question, Phil. Does Judge get it done? Of course he gets it done. He? He's Aaron Judge. Of course he gets it done. TK's hoping he doesn't get it done. My prediction is 60, 64 home runs, okay. John. 64. 64. Okay. But this is surveillance. The questions are tougher. <laughs> what uniform is he wearing next year? He's wearing pinstripes, and there's no doubt about that. But, but, Tom, I've been wrong all year about rates and stocks, so don't ask me. <laughs> Steve, Cohen, Steve Cohen noticed that. So, like, Steve Cohen's, this is, come on. Yeah. Cohen, you know, this is just scream. Right. Steve Cohen is going to pony up the big money. No, Aaron Judge is the next Derek Jeter. He'll be the next captain of the Yankees. How much have they got to pay to keep him in a Yankees uniform? Uh, inflation adjusted a lot of money, a lot of money, John. Like hundreds of millions, yes. right? Yeah. A little more than they offered him uh, before the season started. Unreal. Brian Baseball Cashman money. may be a, a worse trader than anyone on Wall Street. Baseball money, TK. <laughs> Just unreal. Yeah. Unreal. Phil, good to catch up. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Phil Camparelli of JP Morgan Asset Sports Management Report. there. Features down, nine tenths. Bit of bonds, bit of baseball. Just for you, Tom. Yeah, I love it. Okay. We, we didn't mention the Red Sox. Lucky me. We're going to skip that. <laughs> yeah. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, conservative lawmakers say the Bank of England may need to step in to halt the panic over the plunging pound. Sterling fell to an all-time low against the dollar today over concerns about the new government's tax cuts. Some conservatives believe an emergency interest rate hike looks increasingly likely. The OECD has slashed its global forecast for next year, saying the world has been jolted by the war in Ukraine. The Paris-based organization says the global economy will expand just 2.2% in 2023, and that's down from its previous forecast of 2.8%. The OECD also expects further interest rate hikes. Italy is on track to have its first female prime minister. Georgia Maloney won a clear majority in Sunday's election, and that sets her up to head the most right-wing government since World War II. Maloney emerged from the political fringes after leading the opposition to Mario Draghi's technocratic administration. And Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky is calling on Russians to avoid the Kremlin's mobilization effort by fleeing or surrendering. Zelensky says that would help bring a quicker end to what he called the criminal war. Russian men fled to the borders over the weekend after Vladimir Putin's order to call up another 300,000 troops. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We're taking it seriously. Uh, it's not the first time President Putin has made a nuclear threat in this conflict. And we have communicated directly, privately, to the Russians at very high levels that there will be catastrophic consequences for Russia if they use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. We are planning for every contingency, and uh, we will do what is necessary to deter Russia from taking this step, and if they do, we will respond decisively. It's not private anymore. That was Jake Sullivan, the U.S. National Security Advisor on ABC over the weekend. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. And equity futures are down three quarters of 1% on the S&P. On the NASDAQ, we're down about six or seven tenths of 1%. Yields are higher by 10 basis points now on a 10-year, 378. 48. Hard to keep up, Tom. Keep saying that. But euro dollar, hard to get comfortable. Just used to. 96.31 on euro dollar. 107 
on Sterling. It was 103 <coughs> earlier this morning. John, I've been doing this for a few years, and I look at the screen, and every time it's a shock. Right now, it's relentless. Euro breaking down. It's relentless. Euro is almost through the 0 .9, uh, blah, 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 0.9626 level to, to new weakness. Uh, on today, uh, you know, we're not even watching that. We're yeah. watching Sterling and the and the rest. Futures negative 26. Dow futures negative. Thanks for that, Tom. Lisa writes in from six feet away. <coughs> the Mets are doing just fine without Aaron Judge. <laughs> Well, just wanted everyone, everyone to know. I mean, just wanted everyone to know. You know, I didn't want to, you know, break into to the heated conversation, but just As let's a make Mets that fan, clear. You're entitled to jump in and just say and what you think. Let's be honest; they're doing really well. Doing very well. Carry on. Tom. Sure. Thank you. Fine. I predict <laughs> that Mr. Time. Cohen will give Aaron Judge <laughs> equity in the franchise. I Is that what you think, Tom? I think he will give him equity in. The Is franchise. that just to boost his price, T. Can to make it more difficult for the Yankees to hold on? Uh, I think there's part of that. I'll okay. leave that up to Mr. Cohen to comment. If, Steve, if you're watching this morning, we'd love to have Phone you on in. our we'd love that. baseball segment. We don't have to talk, uh, you know, hedgy stuff. Right now we're going to talk politics. Edward Mills with us. Ed Mills, Washington policy analyst at Raymond James. And what we've got here, folks, is decades of good experience. Ed, Jake Sullivan was warbling gaily about 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue's response. I don't care. I want to know what the Pentagon thinks about the Eastern Front of Ukraine and Russia. What is the Pentagon doing given a new Putin and a new nuclear analysis? Well, Tom, I think the uh, White House would say President Biden is the commander of the Pentagon as well. And I think that the thought here is the message has been clearly sent to Putin. It has been sent to his generals. Um, what I think Putin would have to be very concerned about is how well we were kind of uh, anticipating the Ukraine invasion, how good our intelligence is. And I think that the subtle or not so subtle message that Jake Sullivan was sending is um, regime change would be at the top of the list. Uh, if Putin were trying to use any sort of nuclear right. uh, weapon to respond in Ukraine, uh, and so that he has to be fearful personally uh, uh -huh. if he were to do something uh, to escalate this war. In my youth, the great summary, and this is with Gorbachev dying recently, we really didn't have good intelligence on the Soviet Union at the time. Is a Washington watcher, do you suggest our intelligence is better than good here and better than it was back then? I think in the lead up to the Ukraine invasion, it was freaky good. And I think it was so good that our allies did not believe us. And that was probably one of our biggest challenges. Um, Zelensky did not believe us because we've had some pretty big intelligence failures. Look at Afghanistan, look at Iraq. Uh, but we knew exactly what Putin was going to do before he did it. Unfortunately, it did not stop the invasion, but it certainly sent a message to the Kremlin is we're watching you and we know exactly what you are doing here. There's also a sense of desperation that's coming from the Kremlin, especially as you see potential conscripts flee the nation at a rapid pace from Russia, trying to get out before they're being sent to the front lines. You're also seeing Russia trying to make Ukrainians into soldiers for them after grabbing their territory. What's the end game here? How concerning is it? Lisa, you're right, and I think that uh, what we're seeing here is, you know, some acts of desperation uh, <clears throat> coming out of the Kremlin, coming from Putin. Um, the concern is, is that uh, they do have uh, much more that they can escalate. We've described this as a, a attempt to escalate, uh, to maybe go into steelmate, uh, trying to kind of just re-center uh, uh, what is happening in terms of the Ukrainian pushback. What we're watching at Raymond James is one of the ways in which Putin could uh, kind of escalate is through his kind of uh, militarization of energy. Uh, there is an energy embargo on Russian oil going into Europe coming in place on December 5th. The United States is trying to do a first time ever uh, kind of price cap to allow that oil to flow still into Europe. But if uh, Putin further weaponizes energy, which we've seen with the Nord Stream pipeline, uh, how much does that add to the economic concerns that we're seeing in Europe? How much does that add to inflation? How much does that add to kind of the, the you know, kind of fragility, uh, potentially, of the U.S.-NATO uh, alliance? Ed Mills of Raymond James, we've still got to get through winter in Europe. It could be a tough one. It's going to catch up, sir. Thank you very much. Lisa, we've still got a quarter left and some.
of the year for financial markets. And it's felt like a long one already. There's still three months plus to go. The consensus right now for most fund managers that we speak to seems to be buy short-dated U.S. bonds and go to cash. This is not exactly a ringing endorsement of risk. And what we're hearing is they're waiting. There's no reason for them to go into risk because they're actually earning something to stay where, they're, where they are. And the uncertainties are just growing, especially with this backdrop of the political uncertainty and a war and a dictator who is completely unpredictable and backed into a corner. That's only one part of the story. Then I swear you've got global bond yield surge in the dollar that's absolutely dominant. Dominant <coughs> sterling earlier, 103.50 on cable, right now 107. Guy Lebat of Jenny Montgomery, Scott, on, on Twitter. The Prime Minister's spokesperson in the UK said, we won't comment on daily market moves. And Guy said this, Tom, this isn't a daily market move. It's a yearly one that happened in three business days. That's how big the move has been. It's been a yearly well, one in three business days. And that goes to what the pros worry about, including the managing director of the IMF, um, Dr. Gorgieva, the rate of change and the rate of change of the rate of change. We're at second derivative moments here, John. I looked at Canadian dollar. It's log convex. There's an acceleration here, obviously, off of oil and other issues as well. How do you do a 14% depreciation of the loony if you're, you know, crossing at Niagara Falls into Buffalo? You're getting killed. Jordan Rochester is going to weigh in on this, Tom. Looking forward to catching up with him. The G10 FX strategist over at Nomura joining us very, very shortly with a dollar stronger against the pound and pretty much everything else. Euro dollar, sub parity. We're now talking about 96, 95, maybe even 90. Right now, 96.20 on the euro dollar. Futures down, as I say, by about three quarters of 1%. Yield still climbing on a 10 year, 378.28, up 10 basis points on the day. Unreal. Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow for our audience worldwide, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Live from New York this morning. Good morning. Here is your Monday morning price action. We're down on the S&P by seven tenths of one percent. A four-day losing streak into Monday. It looks like it could become five at the opening bell on the Nasdaq. We're down about a half of one percent on the S&P. June sixteenth low three six six six. We're sitting right on top of it going into the opening bell. We'll see if we break below it around the cash open. Look at the bond market. Two tens and thirties as you were. Yields up. 12 consecutive sessions becomes 13 consecutive sessions of yield tower at the front end by 10 basis points on a two year now. 430 on a 10 year, 378. You can do the maths, Tom. Two's tens. What are we now? Negative 50 something? Negative 50 yeah, something. Big, big moves in the, the real yield. My eyes are failing me. Nine basis points now, John. That's a wow statistic. That's a big, big Monday morning move on the inflation. Do you want the year yield. to date carnage, Tom? The year to date carnage. The carnage? The year to date carnage looks a little something like this. We are higher on a UK two year, year to date, by almost 400 basis points. 388, no. call it 389 higher. On a German two-year, we are higher by 262 basis points. On a U.S. two-year, Tom, just a mere I, I, 357. I'll editorialize, John, and say this is moving very, very quickly, and it always redounds back to Washington and the New York Fed. That's what I would watch. That's the pain, Bramo. That's the epicenter of it. Where's the uh, Japanese two-year yield on this? I and think you can, guess, you can guess what that's done year-to-date, <laughs> which is not a lot. Absolutely nothing. I wanted to take a look at some specific movers and specific names and what's happening underneath the service. John, you were asking before, when do we see the downward revisions, not only in the global economic lo uh, outlook, but also in earnings? And what I'm looking at right now is the transportation stocks because they are often a bellwether of what's to come. We have heard from FedEx. They've downgraded their expectations for earnings because less stuff is moving around. People are getting less optimistic and buying fewer items. You could argue this is just a rebound to normalization from the pandemic. Whatever you want to make it the argument, there is a direct correlation with these stocks going down and economic prospects deteriorating pretty rapidly. FedEx shares over the past month down 32 percent, but also UPS in sympathy down uh, more than 17 percent. Just to put into perspective, the S&P over this period wow, is only down 10 percent. Norfolk Southern, the railroad uh, shipping company, down almost 14 percent. And XPO Logistics, this is the, what I find actually most interesting, Tom. This is the one providing services, logistics services, to a lot of transportation names, down nearly 20 percent. How much does portend right. a lack of economic momentum heading into the end of this year? This is really good, Lisa. You've got to do more of this. I mean, this is hugely, hugely valuable, getting us away from what? The same 12 stocks we follow. 
<laughs> you know, every day, whatever it is. Lisa, thanks so much uh, uh, for that. Just brilliant, truly brilliant. Here, futures negative 25. Uh, the VIX out a solid two big figures. That gets the equity market going. On foreign exchange now, Jordan Rochester, I'm going to get one question in here on the globe. John, I know, wants to focus on Sterling. He is with Nomura. Jordan, I'm looking at the intervention experiment of the Japanese. They've made back on a Fibonacci retracement about 70% of the intervention value. What happens to yen? What happens to those institutions when the yen weakens back to where it was before they intervened? It puts the pressure on the politicians, Tom, to do something about rates rather than focusing on the FX intervention. The main problem is for Japan, they are one of the few central banks to still have low interest rates and to be conducting quantitative easing purchases. Until they stop those quantitative purchases, this yen intervention is unlikely to have a material impact on, on moving the yen to a stronger place. What it has done is taken the steam out of the long dollar yen trade. It does make us question, you know, what's the upside in being long dollar yen when you're fighting a central bank with one of the largest FX reserves in the world. But at the moment, the first order was the Japanese most likely use their cash balances. So right. it had very little impact on the U.S. rates market. But if it carries on, it will probably lead to higher U.S. yields, which will make this FX intervention even more difficult to lead to a stronger yen. And, John, that's how everyone's different, as you mentioned earlier, where Japan has ample cash. Maybe the United Kingdom does not. Well, the other issue as well, Tom, with Japan, it's a very domestic bond market, and Jordan can speak to this much better than I can. So a lot of that is priced in yen, the debt, Tom. Um, a lot of it is held at home. The thing I'd say about the UK, and this is an important difference too, is that, yes, a lot of it might be held abroad, 30% of the gilt market held abroad, but, Jordan, a lot of it is sterling denominated anyway, so they don't have that foreign currency problem. So, Jordan, I think the issue we're all trying to grapple with in the UK right now, is this just a normal required adjustment needed to attract capital to finance a big fiscal package through a weaker currency and higher yields? Or is it something bigger than that, something worse? Do we have the ingredients required to have that self-fulfilling downward spiral? I think it's something worse, unfortunately. I don't want it to be worse. This is the country I earn my money in. I'm long sterling, naturally, from my, my salary. But we've just put out a piece um, just before this. I came on live on air. We've now revised lower our sterling view. We were looking for 106 by year end. As you know, we've gone through that rapidly quicker than I expected as well. So now we've adjusted our view. It seems like the market is focusing more on the terms of trade deficit that the, the UK has when it comes to the current account. But there's a terms of trade story with high energy prices and UK imports skyrocketing. So now we're looking for 97.50 in cable by year end. So that is unfortunately below parity. And I've been kind of toying whether to make that call sooner. And the, what the reason I didn't was I thought markets would be concerned about the Bank of England raising rates and that would support the sterling. But now we've switched to an emerging market style crisis where it's become very clear that even with rising interest rates in the UK, it's becoming less attractive to investors as this crisis goes on. And therefore, I think we break through parity in cable uh, before Christmas, uh, probably by the end of November, and we get down to 95 to the end of March next year. That's if nothing is done about this supply side crisis in Europe and if we have high energy prices continue. I could be wrong, though. Yeah. I well, could be wrong if three things happen. The first one uh, is if we have the Bank of England raise rates. Now, we're expecting them to step in with some sort of warning in the market. Ed Conway from Sky was suggesting that might happen today. If they don't raise rates, there's about 80 basis points priced this week. So if they don't raise rates this week, sterling will probably take another hit. But the main thing is on the government side, it's not really the Bank of England that's, that's being challenged here. It's because we're not having a fiscal policy with fiscal rules tethering market expectations to a sort of sustainable fiscal spend. And because of the government doubling down over the weekend saying there's more tax cuts to come, it's why we expect more of these sort of moves to come too. Well, so, Jordan, let's pick up on, on some of those points. Traders now pricing in up to 200 basis points of rate hikes by the Bank of England by November. There is a question, what do yields have to do to get to that 97.50 level without complete capital flight by foreign investors, which is the fear that a lot of people have? We're looking right now at five-year uh, five yields uh, on gilts going vertical, basically at 4.6% right now, up half a percentage point every day, it seems like. Where do we stop here, given your outlook? Well, we're looking for a terminal rate in the UK around 4.5%. The market's doing pretty well, getting close to pricing that. 
That's below by about 100 basis points where we think the Federal Reserve will get to. So 5.5 for their terminal rate in this cycle. We've just, we've just literally revised up that Bank of England call. We were looking for 50 basis points, 50 basis points at the next two meetings. We're now looking for that to be in clips of 75. So it's quite clear the Bank of England do need to step up. Now, what will stop the problem is not the Bank of England. So the reason I mention this is because with an emerging market, there are two ways to stop a currency crisis from getting bad to worse. The first one is aggressive rate hikes to kind of stamp out speculative trading and also to make the risk return on assets more attractive for foreign investors. But the main thing boils down to the, the, where the problem is in the first place, the fiscal side. So usually in the EM space, you'd say, let's have some fiscal austerity, please, guys, reverse those tax cuts. Yeah. And that will shore up the confidence yeah. of investors. We're not getting that in the UK right now. Jordan, as you said, there is some talk about the potential for a Bank of England news conference in the near future. What can they say? What would they potentially do in, a, in such a statement? Well, they need to talk about financial stability, price stability, foreign exchange stability. If the market gets into, it, into the, a framework where the Bank of England is reacting to FX moves, any move we have then met with a rate hike, then perhaps it stems the fall in the currency, the pace of the fall. But I, the main point for me is that the pace will probably slow down. We're quite used to having flash crashes in sterling, unfortunately, since Brexit. So it's not the first time I've woken up seeing on my phone the pounds tumbled 4 to 5%. Usually, this leads to a sort of uh, mean reversion, the pound recovers. But as I said, this time round is a fundamental regime change that's taking place in the UK. In 2016 to 2019, the market was trying to price in what Brexit could look like. Now we know what it looks like. And we've got this energy crisis pushing the trade deficit and the current account deficit to, to historical wides, 8% current account deficit of GDP. This is the definition of a country that should be experiencing these moves in the FX market. So until that changes, until energy markets, if we see prices collapse even further, then maybe I can change my tune. But on the Bank of England side, if they do 100 basis points, let's say this week, and if they signal that they're ready to do more, so give the idea of another intermeeting rate hike. That could help slow the pace of the move. But the point for me is it won't stop it. Well, Jordan, if they did that, they're responding to the move in the market or they're responding to fiscal policy. And what on earth does that look like going into the weekend in the Conservative Party conference? Indeed. The, the, the idea of, of the statement from the, the Chancellor was that he has been speaking to the Bank of England, I think, twice a week was what he said. So it, look, it would be quite embarrassing for the Bank of England because... We assume that they have been given a heads up as to what was in the fiscal package but when they made their decision last week. And like I said, it's this is a market reaction function to the fiscal side. If we look at last week, we had the Bank of England have a, we had a hawkish 50 basis points. We had some members voting for 75. And the market took it pretty well in terms of FX, at least. I know gilts moved quite a bit. But in the FX space, the pound held its ground, waiting for that budget. But it kind of boils down to a point that my colleague Andy Chater is making. What we learned from the budget last week is fiscal rules are out the window until December when we get an idea of what they will be in December. And that uncertainty has made the fiscal side more untethered. And that's what markets hate the most. It's that uncertainty as to what the UK will look like in a few months' time. Jordan, good to hear from you. Jordan Rochester there of Nomura. The range on sterling today, I'll offer it to you. The low, 103.50. The high, 108.46. And right now, just short of one. Oh, wait. That is a monster, monster range in pound sterling against the US dollar. Futures lower six tenths of 1% from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The sell off in UK assets has gone into overdrive. The pound plunged to an all time low before rebounding and government bonds were slammed. Now there are calls for aggressive rate hikes by the Bank of England. The latest tumble was fueled by Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng's comment on Sunday that there is more to come on tax cuts. In China, the Communist Party has reaffirmed President Xi Jinping as its core. The party published its list of almost 2,300 delegates to attend next month's leadership summit. The announcement brings Xi a step closer to clinching an unprecedented third term in power at the event. The price of oil is sinking again thanks to the strength of the dollar and fears that a recession will hammer demand. Brent collapsed below $85 a barrel at one point for the first time since January. The benchmark fell almost 6% last week. 
Perel Weinberg Partners is naming longtime investment banker Andrew Bednar its next executive officer. Now, Bednar is taking over from co founder Peter Weinberg in January. He has been co president of the firm for more than two years and has worked on some of the firm's largest transactions. Credit Suisse says it's working on possible asset and business sales. The Swiss bank is looking for ways to cut costs and restore profits under a strategic plan to be announced next month. No details yet, but Bloomberg has reported that Credit Suisse is considering the sale of its Latin American wealth management operations, excluding Brazil. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We're going to do all that we can at the Federal Reserve uh, to avoid deep, deep pain. And, and I think there are some scenarios where that's likely to happen. There will likely be some job losses. Uh, but I think if you look over the historical uh, history here and, and our economic experiences, uh, there's a really good chance that if we have job losses, it's going to be smaller than what we've seen in other situations. That was Rafael Bostic, the Atlanta Fed Bank president on CBS over the weekend from New York. A whole lot more Fed speak still to come. Lisa can hardly wait. Futures down six or seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. No, it's not just you, it's me too. And Tom, <laughs> and pretty much everyone watching and listening. Futures on the Nasdaq down about a half of one percent. Yield time by eight or nine basis points, 377 on a 10-year. What a turnaround it's been. The dollar dominant, as it often has been this year. Euro dollar 96.46 with negative four tenths of one yeah. percent. Senator Warren with things to say on the Federal Reserve again just yesterday evening. Fed Chair Powell seems determined to push the economy over a cliff, even after he admitted rate hikes weren't lower key prices. Destroying jobs and crushing wages of millions of workers is reckless and dangerous. Recession is not the solution to inflation. Tom, Senator Warren, over the weekend. Well, she's going to have a lot to talk about here, and what she's talking about is instability. Politicians always hate instability, but, John, I would really focus on imagining where we were on the lawn at Jackson Hole with our good interviews and with the events of what, the last four, five, six days led by the United Kingdom, but not just the United Kingdom, the script has changed for all these Fed speakers today. That was 100 basis points ago. Yeah. For anyone that's, well said. that's following. Yeah, yeah. We were at 339.66 at a close on August 26th. And and Lisa, right now on a two-year, we're at 429. So when do we feel this in the forward growth expectations, particularly in profits? Why are we not seeing a big ramification on stocks? And you've mentioned this before. We've been talking about this. And on a day when the dollar is preeminent, when it's roiling everything else, you see bond yields surging. Stocks aren't necessarily tanking. That seems rather orderly. And this, to me, is one of the biggest questions that we've seen over the past few months. What do we go back to, I think, is the one I'm spending a little bit more time thinking about. <laughs> if we've just blown up a decade of zero interest rates and what many people at the time including yourself Lisa referred to as a bond bubble well that bubble's just burst what replaces it what are we going back to are we going back to the previous decade anytime soon or are we transitioning to something very very different and what happens if big tech doesn't return to a leadership position in equity indexes who then takes the mantle is it healthcare stocks really can healthcare and hospitals really take the lead but that's where people are hiding out can it really be some of the industrial names that are flat on their backs because there's less transportation right now in the face of some sort of economic downturn you know there is an entry point and you can feel this in every institutional investor who comes on, getting cash, looking for flexibility. But where is it going to be? And what's going to be the goal over the next decade? Just to pick up on something you said, how compromised will the index be now, given the weightings of some of those big names that have been fueled in some places by what's happened in the bond market? And if they are compromised, have we also just blown up the passive strategy that's done so well? over the last 10 years, Lisa, off the back of some of this. This is what a lot of fund managers are saying. This time is different. Single names uh, will actually be the way to outperform. And you actually could get hammered if you stay in some of these index strategies. We'll see. I mean, it depends on whether we get the cathartic puke that we were talking about earlier. Because if you get that kind of selling, <laughs> then all of a sudden you get a buying opportunity. But it just hasn't gotten to be that sort oh. of catharsis yet, as evidenced, Tom, by your VIX. Chris Harvey yeah. hasn't said it yet. I tell you what, I'd love to catch up with Chris. Yes, I've got so much time people. for someone that's yes. just willing to come out and say, yeah. got it wrong. Because forecasting is tremendously difficult. 
and often you get oh, it wrong. And this is what he said this morning, Tom. Our belief that we would not retest the 22 low until the first half of 23 was wrong. Despite retesting the lows, we feel the market bottom has not been established and stocks will make lower lows in 23. And EPS estimates come down and the Fed tightens into recession. It's that last piece of it, Tom. It's that last piece of it that people have been waiting. I say people, the likes of Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley, waiting for that shoe to drop. And it's the unexpected, in this case, Trussonomics and the global ramifications of that as well. I thought Lisa's board on the railroads there earlier was, was really important. John, Ben Emmons also, with incredibly thoughtful notes, puts out the path here about we go risk on Things start being unstable, and it lifts all boats into the IMF meeting in October towards some levels of illiquidity. And, I mean, that's the reality. That's, uh, that's the worry that's out there right now towards that key IMF Lisa meeting. Lisa used an important word, though, Tom, orderly. Lisa, yes. anything about this from your perspective? Is anything about it disorderly? Yeah, the United Kingdom market right now. <clears throat> period, full stop, which is the reason why we're focusing on it as much as we are. It feels unmoored when you see a 50 basis point move in the five-year gilt yield every single day in consecutive days. When you start to see the pound fall out of bed and people basically saying parity is around the corner with the dollar, uh, we have never seen this before, right? So those are disorderly and might be spurring some sort of response, perhaps from some policymakers. We don't know. We're hearing rumors. Not in the rest of the world, though. You know, at what point do we get a trigger from Japan? At what point do we get a trigger from China, where you see the UN actually weakening to levels that we have not seen for more than a decade? All of these questions, at what point do they come together to create a tension that just has to be addressed? The tension greater? at the moment, I think, is, is rate hike pricing over at the BOE. Yeah. We're talking about an extra 200 basis points now, not over the next year, by November. Tom, by November, can the BOE <clears throat> actually step up and validate the kind of pricing we're seeing baked in by markets, or 200 basis points of it by November. Tom, that sounds like crazy talk. It, it sounds like crazy talk. And when you look at the Bloomberg screen and you look at the standard deviation moves, these are crazy talk moves. So you, you don't say no, but I would think of the second and third order ramifications of that rate increase that you're talking about. Ahead of a Conservative Party conference later this weekend, oh, the political, Lisa, yeah. the political aspect of this not lost on anybody. OK, so let's say the Bank of England comes out and hikes rates by 200 basis points <laughs> by November, basically saying, you want to do this, we're going to basically guarantee that we're going to slow the economy or torpedo it even in order to get some kind of rationale back into the market. Well, then what is the political response? And, and John, you've been asking about this. How do they strip them from some of their power then? Or do, do they, they consider that? And that was a consideration through the summer that they, I think, tried to tried to address when they first took over. It was something that the chancellor basically addressed that the Bank of England independence was somehow secure. The rate pricing issue and how the government would respond to a Bank of England if they did step in as part of that spiral that is so unnerving for everyone. At the moment, a bigger fiscal package is boosting this idea that monetary policy steps in. And to Lisa's point, Tom, if monetary policy steps in, does it then mean that the government comes back and says, hey, there's more to come? That's the kind of self-fulfilling spiral yeah. where things can get even messier. And we're wondering where the circuit breaker comes from right now. Well, the circuit breakers can be there in obvious things like the political battle of Great Britain. But I go back over to the Pacific Rim, John, and look at some of those measurements, the J.P. Morgan EM index and the ADXY, which is the J.P. Morgan series away from yen. And what it shows me when you look at it log is instability there as well. This is not just about the soap opera known as the United Kingdom. No, it's not. It's about the dollar, it's about global bond markets, it's about everything else. And Tom, you've got a spare thought for a bond market that 12 months ago had a two year at about yeah. 20 basis points and in America, and now it's um, 428. Are we gonna get a Four. 77 on West Texas Intermediate? Who knows, I mean, not far away. We're, not there. we're there. Futures down to six tenths on the S&P, on the NASDAQ we're down a half of 1%. Live from New York, heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. global growth 
It's about Fed hawkishness and it's about risk appetite. This was all because of the way market interpreted Fed's rhetoric. Clearly, the Fed has been guiding the markets. Monetary policy is really powerful, but it's not a Swiss army knife. You know, it's not a multi-purpose tool. I think a soft landing is something that you want. It's not something that you would ever count on. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. An historic Monday occurring. And John Farrell, I just saw it in a note from Nomura and Jordan Rochester, the unimaginable, the prediction of sterling below parity. Uh, Jordan Rochester says hope is not a strategy for your United Kingdom. And here are the numbers, Tom. 97 by year end, 95 by Q1 next year. Dollar dominance continues and sterling at the moment, Tom, a real victim of that. For those who don't keep score of this, these are unique times, and they are globally unique times. We're thrilled to bring you later on. Brad DeLong will join us uh, with a new book from Berkeley. Skit Jukes will be with us here uh, in a bit, and Gene Tenuzzo to talk to us about the damage in fixed income. John, the damage is pretty much everywhere, although equities are sort of doing okay. Just about hanging in there. We're down yeah. six-tenths of 1% on the S&P, but Tom, still today, repriced in a terminal rate in many of these central banks. We're looking at yeah. an extra 200 basis points from the Bank of England being price in this market not by the end of next year but by november by the november meeting an extra 200 basis points which is just phenomenal stuff the two year in america and we talked about this a lot 12 months ago was something like 20 basis points right now it's close to 430. tom it's a massive massive change that this whole market has to price off and readjust to a headline from Bloomberg, and when they're important, we do what's called a red sticky. Some of you will see that on television, not on radio. Red stickies on radio look good too, John. Bank of England still to decide if it will comment. On Sterling and the move we've seen. It's a tricky spot for the Bank of England, Tom. Yeah. They only met just last week. <clears throat> a day later, we had this fiscal event. We've got a series of Conservative Party, Labour Party conferences, party conferences this week. So politically, it's pretty tense yeah. as well. Does the Bank of England need to respond to something if they believe this is disorderly? Do you believe this is disorderly or just an orderly adjustment to attract capital back into the UK to finance a monster deficit sum? Well, we'll see. It's original economics. Certainly, that was the reading over the weekend. Lisa Bramos is looking at yield up and price down. And I'm, you know, as we as we mentioned with Phil Camporiel of, of of J.P. Morgan, Lisa, I'm sorry. Price down is negative 18 percent from the joy of months ago. It's been dramatic. And on the flip side of that, let's talk about how much yields have risen. We've been talking about the two-year, the five-year, the ten-year in the United States. How high real yields are going in the credit sphere is possibly one of the most interesting stories that I have seen in the past decade, where you're suddenly getting yield, real yield, absolute yield, nominal yield, 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 nine and a quarter percent yield on high yield bonds right. right now. It's nearly distressed and yet still not enough to lure people in. What is the entry point enough to lure in capital around the world in specific areas and for corporations? Right. I'm going to begin the data check, John, with a pro tip. And this is you look at two dollar indices to see the EM effect and this morning EM is crushed. DXY is up half a percent and the Bloomberg dollar index is up seven tenths of a percent. That's a quick way to see that EM is just crushed on strong dollar. I'll whip through things quickly and yeah. start with the equity market. We're down seven tenths on the S&P. Yields are higher. Again, it feels another leg up in the US dollar, dollar stronger. Also worth going over the year to date numbers. And we did that earlier on. But if you missed it, the numbers are staggering. 20 percent move on sterling weaker 20 percent move on the yen weaker on the swedish currency 20 percent weaker norwegian currency 17 percent the kiwi in new zealand 17 percent 16 percent 15 percent in denmark the euro 15 percent 10 percent the aussie the swiss see seven percent the canadian dollar seven percent weaker tom seven percent is a big big number typically that's real weakness that's the relative outperformance this year in g10 <laughs> These numbers, Tom, they're really, really quite large, and it's off the back of just repricing this Fed a whole lot more than we did at the start of the year. Please stay with us through the day as we look at Fed speaker comments as well. And, of course, institutionally, all of these people, I would say, John, staggering to IMF in October. I mean, sort of, that's the next benchmark here where everybody gets together to say, what now? I need to get to the end of the week first, Tom, before <clears throat> I think about October. Then we've got a whole quarter until year end. Let's try to get to the end of the hour. We do this with Gene Tenuso, head of global fixed income at Columbia Threadneedle. Gene, how has your world changed since Friday? 
Well, Tom, the world has been changing all year. It's been a pretty volatile time for the bond market, as you know. But I think, you know, what the Bank of England and the the policy, the fiscal policy making, I should say, in the UK brings to the bear here is that it's not just domestic forces that are driving yields in the U.S. It's been a painful time in the bond market, but there are forces right. happening in other developed markets that are, you know, basically unconventional policy driving yields to new highs. I look at the price decline, and that's usually what I focus on. But let me be more optimistic today that in investment grade paper, I can finally get a legit yield. If I can get 5% on corporate stuff, how much of this do I want to do? How much do I want to load the boat moving from 2% yield out to an attractive 5%? Lisa just said it, Tom, yield, yield, yield. And I think this is the year that fixed income got its last name back, right? Now, if we look at investment grade assets, these are you know, bonds from companies with significant cash flow that can weather economic and inflation volatility. We're now at a level where not only is that overall yield higher on a real basis, on a nominal basis, but also relative to other risk assets like equities, we see that dividend yields are almost 4% higher or, or excuse me, corporate bond yields are almost 4% higher than dividend yields. So the, the value proposition is very attractive. We've been moving that way in portfolios, and we think that you know, it might be a little bit early in high yield, given the you know, potential for more economic weakness. But investment grade, we think, is very attractive here. When do you start moving into high yield at a time when people do not expect there to be the same kind of default cycle this time around? We just haven't seen that capitulation yet, Lisa. I, I do think that there are reasons why a default cycle, even if we go into recession, will be more muted because we have just recently had several default cycles within the last seven years. We've had you know, a handful of them that have washed out energy companies that have washed out uh, other weaker balance sheets during the pandemic. So we tend to think if you get to that you know, seven or 800 basis point range, lower than the 1,000 basis point spread that typically characterizes a recession for high yield bonds, we think high yield would be attractive at those levels. Gene, something we've reflected on in this program through this morning and over much of the last few months is the fact that we've just blown up a decade of stimulus. QE, zero rates, sometimes negative interest rates. We've blown it all up in the last couple of months. Gene, do you think there's anything about that era that sticks? Is there anything we return to? I, I absolutely do, John. I think all of the toolkit that we've put into place from the financial crisis through the pandemic are tools that will remain in the toolkit. I think what we've realized here is that central banks can move to tighten very quickly, but we have to remind ourselves the Fed really only started tightening six months ago, and that was even very gradual at the start. So we haven't seen really the economic impact of most of the tightening yet. And I think that's what we're going to see in the fourth quarter is real evidence that these measures that have tightened monetary policy and moved the Fed funds rate to restrictive territory are having a real economic impact and will start to give Powell that compelling evidence of inflation easing that he is so desperately looking for. And Gene, this is where, you know, stock traders always come on and give us their opinion about rates. And then rates traders basically say you're not going to feel the effects until the fourth quarter, which just sort of breathes downward revisions to earnings. But I'm not going to go there with yeah. you and force you to put your equity trading hat on. I'm just wondering, though, if we have a sense of when the bulk of the rate hikes that have been baked into market expectations will really hit. You said we'll start seeing it more in force in fourth quarter. How long is the lag time? We think it's six to 12 months, and we started this rate hiking cycle six months ago. So, you know, we're, we're really at that point now where I think, you know, if we think about making investment decisions, not over a six day or six week period, but over a 12 month period, which is what we try to do, you know, at a minimum for our clients, we think you will have ample evidence that inflation is easing. And if we look at a four and three quarters Fed funds rate from a terminal rate perspective that's already priced in next spring, we think that is probably too high or there's good chance that that's too high and the Fed under delivers on that. So the symmetry in the bond market is very, very different than it was a year ago. And I'd rather look at those forward looking indicators than something like the the dot plot from the Fed, which is useful, but mostly backward looking. Hey, Gene, thank you. Gene Tanusa there of Columbia Threadneedle. I think that final point is a really, really good one, Lisa. It reminds me of something Ed Bradford said out on Twitter just last week, and we commented on it on this program. There's a difference between the Fed actually achieving what they've signaled and what they're signaling. It doesn't mean they're necessarily going to deliver it, 
this is what they want to signal right now. And to Jean's point, perhaps they fall short. Which is the argument of bulls. This is sort of the mind-twisting aspect. Sure. That the Fed's not going to be able to go through with it. So they're going to try to play mind games with the market so that they can get the market to where they want it to be to affect the change that they want so they could actually take the foot off the gas uh, next year. And it's just hard to really understand whether the market's going to cooperate it's and what's going to happen. It's tremendously difficult because if everyone yeah. starts to believe what Jean just said, financial conditions ease again and the Fed has to keep them tighter. Exactly. And maybe they even signal a higher terminal rate further down the road. Someone's screaming at the it's, TV right now. I'm sure they are. But <laughs> <laughs> until we until we find a circuit breaker for that it's true then this carries on and that's where we see right now that people are starting to buy the message from the Fed. And it's not just the Fed, John. I mean, right, we've seen this from central banks sure, around yeah. the world. ECB included. How do you bring those confluence of central bank decisions together? Never been done before. They're all talking tough, Tom. They so, continue to talk tough. Well, you know, we're going to see what happens with the Bank of England today, I guess. That's the zeitgeist right now. Tape deteriorates here. John, what I would note in the last 10 minutes, we've seen West Texas Intermediate deteriorate. It's down 37%. From mid-June, net gas in the United States down 34% just over the last month or so. These are the kind of moves uh, you know, that Gene's talking these about. These are Tom. big, big, these are tangible moves nobody's talking about. Kid Juice of Sock Gen has been talking about it. He's going to join us shortly on this FX market. What a crazy couple of days. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, conservative lawmakers say the Bank of England may need to step in to halt the panic over the plunging pound. Sterling fell to an all-time low against the dollar today over concerns about the new government's tax cuts. Some conservatives believe that an emergency interest rate hike looks increasingly likely. The Bank of England has yet to decide whether it will comment on the pound. The OECD has slashed its global growth forecast for next year, saying the world has been jolted by the war in Ukraine. The Paris-based organization says the global economy will expand just 2.2% in 2023, and that's down from its previous forecast of 2.8%. The OECD also expects further interest rate hikes. Italy is on track to have its first female prime minister. Georgia Maloney won a clear majority in Sunday's election, and that sets her up to head the most right-wing government since World War II. Maloney emerged from the political fringes after leading the opposition to Mario Draghi's technocratic administration. Perella Weinberg Partners is naming longtime investment banker Andrew Bednar its next chief executive officer. And Bedmar is taking over from co-founder Peter Weinberg in January. He has been co-president of the firm for more than two years and has worked on some of the firm's largest transactions. More than half of U.S. shoppers are willing to pay more for healthy food, even as inflation cuts into their budgets. A survey from Deloitte finds that consumers see a connection between well-being and food choices. In order to save money, they are switching from brands to private labels and reducing online shopping to avoid fees. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Quarting at the weekend um, fueled this sell-off of the pound by doubling down on his package on Friday and suggesting that there is more to come. That's not what financial markets want to hear. They want to hear that the Chancellor has got a serious plan for getting a grip of the public finances. We didn't hear that on Friday. We didn't hear it over the weekend. And now we have that reaction in global financial markets. It's all upside down in the UK right now. That's Rachel Reeves, the UK Shadow Chancellor. So the Labour Party Labour. talking about balancing the books, which is typically what the Conservative Party is doing, Tom, about the Labour Party, if you're Can up to I speed. This there we go. John, that was brilliant. Can I ask a dumb question? Nothing's people, dumb right now, Tom. Do the people of the Conservative Party support trussonomics? That is one of the questions of the moment, Tom. Do they support it given how the market action has built up know. over the last week? And will we get any kind of pushback going into the Conservative Party conference later on this week? I think that's an important yeah. question, Tom. I'm almost afraid to look away from the Bloomberg terminal. There's so much movement. Futures in negative 31, VIX out 2.45 points. It's a, a challenging morning, which is always a good excuse to speak to Kitschuks. He's chief FX strategist at Society General. Can you commit a trade on Sterling here, Kit? Can you advise SockGen clients of a tradable effort in pound Sterling? 
Uh, look, I, I don't think in near term that you can sell it now on a Monday afternoon after such a big washout, but you've got to understand that if you buy it, you have to have deep enough pockets to be able to cope with the volatility. Uh, we have uh, extraordinary levels of volatility, both implied in terms of what the market trades and, and in terms of what's coming. Uh, I do think we're, you know, we're not a million miles from the bottom, but we will get a lot of volatility both ways in the course of the coming days and, and, and possibly weeks, because this this isn't going to really improve, actually, as part of anything else, until the dollar turns around. That's part of it, but also until people start to be more confident about what's happening to uh, the management of the UK economy. So okay. um, it's tough. You published earlier this morning and you put this chart in there and it's just this massive divergence between the gilt treasury spread and what's happening with sterling. Kip, why is that important and what does it tell you? Well, it tells you this is a loss of confidence, at least to some degree, in, in policy because normally, I mean, you know, President Reagan and Paul Volcker managed to put rates up an enormous amount and ease fiscal policy dramatically and sent the dollar to the moon. Uh, at one level, the UK Chancellor and the Bank of England doing the same thing and sending it, I don't know, to the floor. Uh, and so that tells you that, that what, what, what is here is a, is a crisis of confidence, um, which, you know, if, if the economy holds and things pull together, which is probably what happens in the long run, um, that that will provide buying opportunities. But you can't solve this crisis of confidence overnight, uh, and you need to be careful how you manage it. If the Bank of England comes in this afternoon and raises rates again, uh, for example, would that add to the sense of panic or would that calm things? Uh, I suspect that we have to go through more fear in the short term before anything else happens. And the other piece to it is, you know, we, we look at it all which way around. Why are bond yields rising? They're rising everywhere. The U.S. Treasury market's pushing higher. The U.K. is just going more. Why, why is the pound down? Everything's down against the dollar this month. The pound just is a wonderful candidate to be the, uh, the, the, the currency that's most beaten up because of this loss of confidence in policy making. Okay, but John and Tom were asking about this earlier. Does that make what we're seeing orderly or disorderly? It's becoming, well, disorderly. It's becoming, it's becoming slightly more chaotic. It, 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 this, this, to me, feels very much like you know, the, the beginning of the final chapter of this dollar move uh, because we've got volatility levels spiking up um, so much in so many different assets, but also because the equity market's rolling over. So I think this is the back end disorderly, yes, because this morning's moves were disorderly in a thin Asian market. Let's let's see how it goes. But uh, you know that that's kind of that's kind of self-evident. That doesn't mean we can't go lower before we're done, and it doesn't mean that you can put order back into this market very easily. So, Kit, you just said that it appears that this is getting disorderly in the final uh, final throes of the dollar's dominance. What does that mean? What's the reversal? I mean, is it a sharp devaluation of the dollar? Is it just sort of a normalization in terms of FX volatility? I, I think we'll, we'll see. I mean, again, don't get me wrong. I think this plays through the fourth quarter of this year. So, uh, you know, I think that, but I think it means that, let's go this way. I think at the minimum, the dollar is going to be weaker at the end of next year than it is today. And I'll put it in that kind of time frame. So I'm not getting myself excited. I think that we're at a level where, you know, if I bought 10-year notes um, today, I'd probably be okay in the long run, but I'd suffer some more pain between now and Christmas. If I bought the pound, the same thing. So it feels to me as if, you know, certainly monetary policy in the States is working in the sense that all asset markets are reacting. Oil prices are lower, equities are lower, the whole curve's priced higher. The curve's priced sufficiently higher for longer uh, that it's going to do its work. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get that in, in all of these countries um, coming through the system. But that doesn't, mean, uh, that doesn't mean it's easy to trade the next month or two. Okay, just quickly, if the Bank of England did come out today, what could they possibly say? I think all they could say, I mean, if they do anything, I, look, I, I would be very, very surprised if they intervene in the foreign exchange market. The UK deliberately doesn't have a large stash of foreign exchange reserves um, and, and is a big believer in the <coughs> idea that uh, unilateral intervention isn't terribly productive. Right. So uh, they can bring forwards the rate hikes that are coming uh, the next one on the 3rd of November, if I've got my dates right. Um, maybe do, if they were going to do 75, they could talk about doing 1% and now how to kind of front load some of the rate hikes to send a clear message. I don't know if front loading your policy tightening, uh, just to go to sound tough, makes a huge amount of difference when what we have is this, you know, fiscal easing on one side, monetary tightening on the other side. Do they, you know, do they work right. together? What are these guys up to? Uh, kid, I just very quickly here, I just did a fancy study you can do in the Bloomberg of the, of the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index for the United Kingdom. There has been a four standard deviation move 
accommodative off of all this policy when you put the secret sauce into the index. If the Bank of England moves, they don't get back to where they were. How far back do they how far back do they take away the new accommodation if they make a move today or tomorrow? Uh, they take some back. They also change the nature of it because the Bank of England um, accommodates, uh, so it takes back the accommodation that you've given through a weaker currency and easier fiscal policy by raising the cost of borrowing. So these affect different bits of society, different bits of the economy. So you, you kind of scramble everything up a little bit more. Um, I, I don't think it alters the fact, though, that the UK economy is heading into, if not already in, a recession at this point of time, despite phenomenally tight labor market. And that, that's part of the challenge. You'd like more growth, but you need more slack in the economy if you're going to defeat inflation. Uh, and, and these kind of policy messages from all sorts of angles, it's very hard to sort of sum it all up in, in just one financial conditions index. But yeah, no, they're not going to get back to the same financial mm -hmm. conditions as they had before unless they can get sterling to go back up, which would be lovely, but isn't going to happen. Either. Hey, Kit, thank you. It's good to hear from you. Kit Jukes there of Sokgen. What a wild time in foreign exchange with the dollar absolutely dominant. Futures down five or six tenths of 1% on the S&P from New York. This is Bloomberg. Sixty minutes away from the open and bow futures off the lows. We're down a half of one percent. Good morning to you on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're down about four tenths of one percent. Yield still higher, heading north up seven basis points. Three seventy five eighty seven. Dollar still stronger. Euro dollar ninety six fifty four. And winding a ton of weakness out of sterling from early this morning. We've gone from like one oh three through one oh seven on cable. David Gura with the meme of the moment out on Twitter. You all know that meme, Tom when it's the boyfriend holding the hand of his girlfriend, but he's looking the other way as the girl in the red dress passes, past, passes by him. He's markets. The girlfriend's the Italian election. The girl in the red dress is UK tax cuts. <laughs> no one's talking about the Italian election this morning, Tom, at all. Just not a feature of the conversation. Yeah, I think that that's, it's fair to say. It is momentous and it you know, speaks to what's going to go on in Brussels in that, but it has been overwhelmed. I, I would say... One of the first things I looked at today was the Italian-German spread, just to see if it unravels. I think, John, it's safe to say it did not unravel. Yeah, it was all heading in the right direction, yeah. or rather the wrong direction, depending on what side of the trade you're on, Tom. <coughs> yeah. Yields are all heading higher worldwide, with the exception of Japan, for very specific reasons. And again, euro uh, from you know 105, 112, it'll never go below parity. 0.9653 speaks to what's the next step uh, there as well. Let's get to it. An important conversation with Stephen Whiting, chief investment strategist, chief economist at City Global Wealth Investments, with terrific experience. And as I've said many times, parsing corporate profits, corporate America into what we expect to see in our economy. Stephen Whiting, how have you adjusted to the new rates of change in foreign exchange and bonds in the real interest rate? How have you adjusted in the last 10 days? Well, you're either in a defensive position or you're looking at a lot of immediate pain in portfolios that you can't turn the clock back on. Um, you know, we have been adding U.S. Treasuries not because the yield is some incredibly high, beautiful, inflation-adjusted level, but it's a defensive asset that's probably going to work for a period when the economy turns. And unfortunately, we are heading for a turning point in the American economy, and I think we'll do that quite uh, well below the rates uh, that the Fed uh, is signaling for 2023. 90 days ago, we were angsting about corporate earnings, and I think they did better than good Someone out there has October 14 as a launch date here. We're now a little bit away from there, but let's go to your expertise there. Are we going to be shocked again at a resilient corporate America? Well, we probably shouldn't be. The look back at the third quarter is still going to be a period of, of rising production, rising inventories. That's a problem for next year's profits, not for this year's profits. What's happened in financial markets and financial profits is telling us where we are headed for the coming year. Um, we would expect about a 10% decline in U.S. EPS next year, again, at a level well short of the Fed funds rate uh, that they are guiding us to, again, to try to maximize the impact, to sort of pull all hope away 
um, from the notion that they might pivot. Uh, but if you take a look at what the Fed is forecasting, the unemployment rate to be about a half point uh, within this range for the next three years, we think it's very unlikely. We think that the U.S. is headed closer to 2 million job losses net uh, over the course of next year. Uh, and that's, again, if the Federal Reserve will ultimately not continue to tighten through those job losses. But we wouldn't expect them this year, right? The lags between where the economy, uh, again, started to absorb these rate hikes and where it is right now, it's not going to be immediate. We would expect non-farm payrolls to grow through the rest of the year. And just one really simple example. If you think about what's happened to the monthly pace of new home sales, it's down 51%. But home completion, spending, construction uh, spending, or even employment in residential construction, is down 2% in the new cycle high for employment. That's because we were building houses and starting these projects a year ago at a lower interest rate level and a higher sales pace. So these are the types of things that have to work through the economy. But forward-looking financial markets should be focused on next year. Stephen, where are we heading in terms of the new normal? Are we heading toward a, a rebound, the likes of which we haven't seen in 2009 at some point, if the Fed does shift gears or if there is some sort of washout event? Or are we heading toward a lost decade of profits where you get basically leadership meandering from one area to another and not from big tech? What I would imagine is that we can have a cyclical recovery in 2024. Right. Unfortunately, we've simply run a pro-cyclical monetary policy with the help of fiscal policymakers turning COVID into a boom, right? Not having targeted limited stimulus, giving a boom and then taking it away and driving a bust. Um, these are not the things that sort of drive uh, economic growth for a 10-year period of time. Uh, again, it's some really rough elbows here from, from policy. Uh, but it's not going to, again, stop innovation. It's not going to stop any of the things that drive uh, economic growth in the long run. Just take a look at 2002. That was a period in which the NASDAQ fell 78%. But some of the key innovations that drove growth over the coming 20 years were literally invented at that time. Apple's iPod, iOS. These are just examples <clears throat> of things right. that move the trillion-dollar economic gains for, for years and years to come. And I'm sure that Tom will pick up on this, and he's been talking a lot about this adapting, the adjusting, the innovation. On the flip side, there's also the social aspect overlaid on top of this, especially as inflation starts to bite into the lower and middle income uh, Americans and globally. And we're seeing that in elections. That we're seeing that in a lot of the strikes and the uprisings. How do you price in political risk at a time when it's really coming to the forefront? Well, it's not terribly easy, and usually these types of political risks in nine out of ten cases uh, in the last 80 years have not been turning points for the world economy. Um, they matter a lot in terms of uh, driving local, regional crises, um, but they don't really turn around the world economy. Now, unfortunately, there is a lot um, of bad news to absorb here. And markets could have seen more of this coming, perhaps. They may overreact to this. Uh, but ultimately, curing inflation at what we expect will end up being, unfortunately, a good deal of cyclical economic pain, right? It's going to come at the expense of the labor market. But we're not going to have long-term inflation instability, right? That's what I think one of the messages that we're going to see. So we're going to end up oh. interest rates peaking at a relatively low level, uh, and uh, unfortunately, we had to go through a, a boom and bust cycle. But uh, whether you can feed that back to a particular political outcome that's going to change the economy, um, all we can do, again, is have some safe assets uh, in our portfolios in that event. Right. But then looking at the Citigroup platform, and, and you, know, you guys have been phenomenal uh, with Hollenhorst on, on the Fed call and all that. Stephen Whiting, when does the United States not ignore what's going on internationally? When is the point where it becomes like what you and I studied in the 90s, where, I'm sorry, international matters? It could take some time. Unfortunately, the Federal Reserve is focused very much on lagging economic indicators. In fact, domestic <laughs> services prices core services, uh, again, have got, uh, you know, a power to them. They are a component of the index of lagging economic indicators. And if you just focused on, well, 2%, we need that 2%. 
well, we could be deep into a recession before we see 2% on these measures again. Uh, and so these effects from around the world, we think, will compound against some of the, the downward pressure on the economy, downward pressure on prices. We don't expect uh, every CPI reading to look like August uh, on the core going forward. Uh, but it's going to be a while before you really see that in the economy. So patience, something that central banks told us to have for a while, they've run out of it. And uh, it would be a good time for us uh, to realize it again. The one thing that we heard out of Chairman Powell that was really uh, it was a minor point at Jackson Hole was that it's going to take some time to get inflation lower. And if they try to achieve it very, very quickly, we're going to end up with a much more cyclical trade off, more than is necessary. I'm going to feel some pain along the way as well. Stephen Weiner, thank you. City Global Wealth Investments. I have to say that things are settling down a little bit now this morning. Futures are down a half of 1% on the S&P 500. In the FX market, sterling almost unchanged on the day against the US dollar. Euro dollar, 96.68, only negative two-tenths of 1%. So some of that dollar strength, we fade that just a little bit. At the front end of the yield curve on a two-year, we were through 4.30 back down to about 426, up on a session by five over. or six basis points, but certainly settling down, Tom, in the last hour or so. Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm going to signal it as the Bank of England rumors. I, John, is that the right word? Speculation? speculation. Yeah. I think speculation. Yeah, but I, I would say that was the hallmark as people wait and they're trying to adapt it just to what we could see. I, You know, my opinion doesn't matter here, John, but they've got like a choice set. That's all there is to it. Do nothing, jawbone it, do something tangible. Say they're going to think about doing something tangible. Or wait. Or wait. Or wait. And wait, wait is their the best next, friend. The next meeting, at least for a while away, start in November. If markets are already pricing in 200 basis points of rate hikes, why not let the market do what it's going to do and not weigh into the political exactly. regime? And that seems to be uh, what some people are saying. So if they do come out and say something and they do raise rates, what kind of political uh, bullseye are they putting on their backs? And if they don't, well, the market maybe will move away from what they're expecting. We'll have to see. I say things are a quieter day. Quieter, not quiet. If you're looking at the UK two year up 51 basis points and a 10 year up 28, I mean, it's still a meaningful <laughs> move, Lisa. Yeah, and this really goes to Kit Jukes's point. Are we seeing the beginning of the end of the dollar bull run? Are we seeing the washout kind of phase of some of the peak hawkishness? I hear grunting going on outside of this. Is that grunting studio. or growling? Growling, grunting. Growling? He doesn't growl. He's not a bear, okay. but he does grunt because, you know, that's what we do here. But I guess I, I'm just, uh, you know, we'll have to we'll have to see. Maybe peak hawkishness didn't really work a couple months ago. Will it work now? TK, you were the only one that didn't send me ice cream over the weekend. AMH sent me Van Leeuwen, three tubs of the stuff. God, got some from San Jesus, Ambrose. The, the case of three Jenny Creamel got lost in the mail. You're the I'm only sorry. one that did send me ice cream. He's being paid in pounds now. I know, seriously. <laughs> Come on. Donate to the tooth pain. <laughs> you doing all right? No. No. What you Get can do, John, is you can take an ice cold Narragansett lager beer and hold it against this your That would be that, and then drink it this through the show. This isn't working for you? This, to ease isn't, the pain? this isn't working out. Priya <laughs> Misra. She's going to ease the pain later with Jim Bianco and Tony Despirito. They're going to count you down to the opening bound in just a moment. Bloomberg. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Bank of England hasn't decided whether to make a statement following the collapse of the pound to its lowest level ever. Conservative lawmakers say the central bank may need to step in to halt the panic. Some believe an emergency interest rate hike is likely. In China, the Communist Party has reaffirmed President Xi Jinping as its core. The party published its list of almost 2,300 delegates to attend next month's leadership summit. The announcement brings Xi a step closer to clinching an unprecedented third term in power at the event. Initial sales of the iPhone 14 in China were smaller than the device's predecessor a year ago. That's according to a note from Jefferies. The firm says 987,000 units were sold in the first three days, an 11 percent decline from comparable sales of the iPhone 13. Credit Suisse says it's working on possible asset and business sales. The Swiss bank is looking for ways for to cut costs and restore profits under a strategic plan to be announced next month. 
No details yet, but Bloomberg has reported that Credit Suisse is considering the sale of its Latin American wealth management operations, excluding Brazil. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Our forecast certainly is a challenging one because we are forecasting a significant slowdown of the economy um, to, say, the United States growing at 0.5% next year, uh, the euro area growing 0.3%, and still a, a slowdown uh, in China this year, next year recovering a little bit, but still, you know, globally, we're talking about significant s slowdown. The OECD acting chief economist, Alvaro Pereira, good to hear from him here. And this is, of course, oil uh, moving downward, 78.62, down 37 percent from the panic of $120 a barrel. Lisa Bramlitz and Tom King, Jonathan Farrell getting ready uh, for the 9 a.m. effort. And right now, and this is a joy for me, long ago and far away, we had to reopen our San Francisco offices, a beautiful platform down in the Bay. And they said, we want to do an event. And they said, who should we get? And I said, there is only one name on the West Coast that intellectually lights it up each and every day. He had a website slouching towards Utopia, and his name was Brad DeLong, professor of economics at Berkeley. Finally, and I mean finally, we have his 500 pages slouching towards Utopia. And what I really want to emphasize here before we bring the professor in, this is a book for conservatives. It's a book for cons the liberals love it. I get that. His PhD advisor Summers at Harvard and all that. But more importantly, this is a book for conservatives going, what the hell happened? Brad DeLong joins us in celebration of slouching towards utopia. Brad, you mentioned fascism seven, eight, nine times within slouching towards utopia. Italy, the shock today. Hungary as well. What the United States has been through over the last X number of years. How close are we to Mussolini. Um, we're still quite far away from Benito Mussolini. Um, we're still much closer to, say, someone like Andrew Jackson, who stole a third of the land in North Carolina from the Cherokee and sent them off to Oklahoma, or similar politicians who are find internal or external enemies and focus people against them as a way of trying to deal with the fact that they really cannot handle managing the economy that they've been given. If middle liberals or middle conservatives read Slouching Towards Utopia, what is your prescription to get the middle of our political economics back in control of the voice, or is it further polarized America forward? Well, we never have had control since 1870. We, sometimes, however, we've been extremely lucky, right? That is, since 1870, for the first time in human history, the value of human technology has been doubling every generation, and governments have been kind of unable to ride this particular Schumpeterian creative destruction tiger, largely because governments have been looking backward, and yet each generation, the technological underpinnings of the economy are so different that successful economic policies have to be different as well, that what worked a generation ago no longer works. And what you can cobble together now won't work in a generation. Brad, we're looking at a rearranging of order in a lot of ways economically with the end of the zero mm -hmm. rate uh, world. And we're yep. seeing the beginnings of a reordering or a push to reorder things in a political regime. What is going to be, from your perspective, the defining feature of the next decade politically with some of these policies as they try to move away from concepts of modern monetary theory? You can't just print money endlessly. Inflation's back a real thing. Where does fiscal support play a role in this? Well, in the United States, I suppose it really depends on whether Jay Powell and company realize that all of the tightening of financial and monetary conditions that happened last winter and spring have not yet hit the economy. 
right? That is, there is a lot of monetary contraction and austerity coming down the pike that's not visible in the data yet. Um, if they kind of, um, if they are calm and patient and recognize that they've already done a lot more to cool off the economy than they currently see in the data, then we might actually manage to make our way through. Um, if not, you know, then not. And certainly the width of the strait between the monsters Scylla and Charybdis, you know, that there was kind of a wide path to go through last November, even last December. But come February and Vladimir Putin, all of a sudden the kind of strait is very, very narrow and the ship may not be, sail through, be able to sail through it. Indeed, there may not even be a strait at all left. How optimistic are you about the nodes of potential improvement, given that all of the tech has not been able to create the utopia that you or a lot of people thought would uh, occur once some of these developments had gone into place? Well, you know, it is, it is absolutely flummoxing right? that um, humanity's technological prowess doubling every generation since 1870 um, that means for the first time in human history, we can actually bake a sufficiently large economic pie for everyone to have enough. And, you know, utopian thinkers of all previous centuries thought that once you could have get everyone enough, right. all of a sudden a huge <clears throat> amount of the nastiness would fall away yeah. from human governance. And yet killer robots still stock the sky in right. still stock the skies above Ukraine and Syria. Brad, I got time for one more question as we celebrate slouching towards utopia. There was a professor at Berkeley, his name was Chad Jones. He went to another school across the bay. I can't remember uh, what it was called. Chad Jones owns basic economic growth. It has failed so much of America. Jeff Sachs is encyclopedic on this. Where's the optimism mm -hmm. we can develop to take half of America not participating and bring them back into the fold. What's the DeLong prescription? Well, it's to recognize that we've been trapped here in this world since 1870, in which each generation technology races forward at an unbelievable rate, and each generation a huge number of people are left behind. You know, the Midwestern farmers who supported right. William Jennings Bryan in the 1890s, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to simply recognize that this is not a new problem, but this is something that we have been grappling with and failing to deal with since 1870, will at least let us see our current situation in perspective. Mm. Brad, we got to leave it there. Brad DeLong out, and I can't say enough, folks, the thickness here on radio, all you need to know yeah. is it's got the DeLong depth to it here, slouching yep. towards it's, utopia. And again, I want to make this It's a transoceanic book. It's a transoceanic book. It's not a, fl it's not a flying around the East Coast book. Yeah, it is very transoceanic, and also it's something that you have to read. And what I'm going to say, my two cents on this is simple. It's a book for conservatives. I know none of them believe me here, but DeLong has written a book on our economic history that's really quite extraordinary, slouching towards utopia. Utopia is out there, Lisa, somewhere, isn't it? <laughs> well, we haven't gotten there yet, and that, I guess, is the message, despite all of the innovations and despite the fact that we have enough. And uh, this is going to be a really important point because we have a fascinating moment that we're in with collective rate hikes, yeah. with a rethink of inflation oh. after years where it was uh, more abound. John Taylor comes in from Palo Alto. Thank you so much, John Taylor, for emailing in. He says, Jones is at a school called Stanford. It was good to clear that up. Professor Taylor, thank you so much for clearing that up. Markets, more markets through the morning. This is Bloomberg.